Go on. Go on. Hello? Chris, the show starts in two minutes. Are you ready? Yeah, 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 no problem. Of course I'm ready. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, see you shortly. Bye. Oops. Hey Sally, how are you? You are in so much trouble with Ed. What are you doing? He's in such a panic. You know how how he likes to plan things out and everything is ready and we've only got two minutes before on air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've run out of toothpaste. Really? Can't you go on camera without cleaning your teeth? But hey, seriously, here's some of mine. Hey, Chris. I'm in a bit of a panic. I don't know what tie to wear. It's only 20 seconds before we go live. Grab some of mine. Here you go. Finally, I'm ready. Are you? Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Startup Sunday Live. I'm Edward Pollock and I'm delighted to be hosting you as part of this virtual celebration of cohort two of our RG Startup Accelerator programme. Who would have thought that three months ago, instead of hosting this in the Sandman Signature Hotel as a live canapes and cocktails, we would be here live in my living room. So, um, welcome to joining our celebration. Hopefully you're sat at home enjoying this and you'll be able to enjoy our broadcast throughout the day. We have an amazing lineup of startup pitches, guest speakers, and exciting entertaining content. So thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, being at home isn't so bad. Your travel time is that little bit shorter. And this new format does mean that we have viewers from all around the world, from Spain to Japan, from Mexico to Estonia. Hello to everyone who is watching us live at home. Everyone has come together to watch this and support our amazing startup teams. And while this event may be different, we are delighted that despite the challenges, the 21 teams that we are here to celebrate today are as resilient and creative and ambitious as ever. These are the businesses that will go on to inject our economy with new products, services, and jobs for the future. Now, over the past five months, these teams have tested their ideas, they've met with mentors, they've pivoted their business models, and are now ready to take the next steps on their business journey. Today, 10 finalists are competing for additional prize funding, awarded by our panel of judges and you. Now, before we get into all of that, we are delighted that we have some fantastic guest speakers to share some opening words to support us. The RG Startup Accelerator is possible thanks to a generous donation from the Wood Foundation. And we are delighted to have our guest speaker, Sir Ian Wood, Chancellor of Robert Gordon University and Chairman of the Wood Foundation here to give an opening address. I'm now gonna cut to you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sir Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I first of all express my warm congratulations to Chris Wool, Edward Pollock, Sally Charles and Graham Carter, with help from Margaret Craig and Nigel Cariani on managing to set up and organise this virtual award ceremony as the culmination of the second year of the RGU Entrepreneurship Competition. 
It's no mean feat to have persuaded so many key stakeholders in business and entrepreneurship to participate, including, I'm delighted to say, Ivan McKee, MSP, who's our Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, and he will be the keynote speaker in this Startup Sunday live event. As Chancellor of Robert Gordon University, and I may say a very proud Chancellor, um, I really am always delighted to see the significant progress and achievements and the impact it has on so many different walks of life in the northeast of Scotland, not the least of which is the business world. Today's event, we're celebrating the development of 21 startup businesses who spent the last eight months developing their business ideas and projects. Now we have this virtual video broadcast, which includes messages from key supporters, startup video pitches, judges, and audience voting, together, of course, with the award announcements. So, a second big congratulations to the RGU Entrepreneurship Management Team for managing to overcome all the challenges of virtual organisation to actually see the event through to this final and now to the Startup Sunday Live Awards. Aberdeen is definitely an entrepreneurial city, significantly based on the very strong oil and gas activities we have. Right now, this is an extremely hard time with the COVID-19 virus still going pretty strong and the significant impact of lockdown being felt everywhere. What is incredible is how this virus has spread across the world, infecting now over 5 million people and slowing the world down badly. On top of that, we've got a very significant reduction in the price of oil, which is hitting a city still heavily involved in oil and gas. Luckily, we've now got some focus on what's called energy transition, which is effectively developing net zero industries in offshore wind, hydrogen as a fuel and carbon capture and storage alongside and getting the benefits of our oil and gas knowledge. However, here we are this afternoon. We've got 21 successful startup businesses presenting, and that's an indication of how enterprise and entrepreneurship can succeed. Of course, RGU itself is a very enterprising university, providing a lot of really high quality graduates for our new industries. The imagination and entrepreneurship of these young people uh, bodes so well for the future. One of the most exciting developments has been the, the One Tech Hub, which combines Opportunity Northeast with Codebase from Edinburgh and RGU in Aberdeen, providing a range of digital products, service technologies and activities. Entrepreneurship truly provides the essential new blood and inspiration in any region, and certainly in our region, and I congratulate all of today's finalists on the quality of their enterprise. So. We're delighted to have Ivan McKee here, Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, to introduce this online Startup Sunday live event. Minister, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Ian, for that introduction. And thank you very much to Professor Harper and the team at RGU for inviting me along today to take part in your Startup Sunday, the showcase of the successful startup teams that have come through the RGU Accelerator Programme and the opportunity as a consequence of that for you to launch new businesses. And we had a chat earlier on about the decision that the RGU team had taken to go ahead with the event this year, the second year of the Accelerator Programme and to have a showcase like this and to do it online. And I must say that the decision to go ahead with this event is absolutely the right one because not only does it allow you to keep the momentum going from the very successful showcase event last year, but it also allows you to and the team to understand and be able to work with the new technologies that are now coming to the fore as we move through and beyond this crisis. And I've no doubt that these new technologies and innovative ways of using them will be absolutely central to our success coming out of the crisis and the innovation that's going to drive that. You'll be very well aware, and I don't need to describe to you Scotland's huge history of successful innovation going back decades, in fact, going back centuries. And it's something the Scottish Government, and in my role as Minister for Innovation, takes very seriously through the Scotland Can Do initiative, the work that we do there with organisations such as Scottish Edge, CivTech, Interface, and many, many others to get an entrepreneurial spirit embedded in universities and businesses throughout Scotland, and then to work with startup companies to make them able to deliver and contribute to Scotland's economy. And there's so many sectors where Scotland has such a leading edge 
it's absolutely wonderful. If you look at our digital sector, what we're doing, fintech, life science sector, a sector that's really coming to the fore now as we fight against the coronavirus crisis. What's happening in green energy and the transition from uh, to renewable energy sources, something that's absolutely central to the economy of the Northeast. The space sector, something very much in the news at the moment and a sector that Scotland is really leading the way in. Food tech, tourism, so many sectors where our traditional sectors but we have adapted and are driving innovative technologies in those sectors. So right across the piece, Scotland is leading the way in so much of that activity and the Scottish Government is proud to be a big supporter and encourager of that. And we've had some success. We see the number of startups in Scotland increasing year on year. We see spend in R&D from businesses increasing year on year. And as I said, the North East is a key part of that in Scotland's economy, an area that frankly has had challenges as a consequence of the oil and gas downturn, but the sector has absolutely grabbed the opportunity to move forward into new renewable energy sources. And the innovation and technology that's happening there is genuinely world beaten and something that I, um, as the Minister for Innovation, is hugely proud to have been involved in. And I want to talk about the role of universities in this whole. Um, drive towards innovation across Scotland. Scotland, as you know, benefits from having some of the top universities in the world. We have more top universities per head of population in Scotland than any other country in the world. And universities have been absolutely central to that drive towards innovation and working with businesses across our economy. And that is all about encouraging students to have that entrepreneurial attitude as so evident in this accelerator program at RGU. It's about encouraging the startup businesses, something I hope many of the businesses, all of the businesses coming through this program go on to be successful, employ people and contribute to the economy. And it's about using the great technology that our universities have as a platform to support R&D in businesses and particularly in startup businesses. As we come out of this crisis, innovation is going to come to the fore. There are so many challenges it's thrown up and also so many opportunities across so many sectors. The Economist has said that there will be five years worth of innovation is going to happen in the next 18 months as a consequence of the crisis. I want Scotland to be at the forefront of grabbing those opportunities and delivering on them. And I want businesses like the ones that the students that have come through this program, this accelerator program, are starting to be absolutely at the centre of that drive towards innovation and the solutions to the crisis going forward and driving innovation across all sectors in Scotland's very vibrant economy. You're a key part of that recovery. RGU and other universities in Scotland are an absolutely key part of that recovery. I understand that the showcase event today is going to be very informative, very entertaining and something that's going to really highlight the best that Scotland has to offer. The I understand also that the focus on the gender balance has been absolutely significant. 44% of participants in the showcase are female. And I also understand the international aspects of that have been absolutely central, with more than 14 countries represented amongst the teams that are taking part today. And I know that there are international audiences watching the showcase event today. So I hope you have a great day. I hope it's really successful. And more importantly, I hope the businesses that you're starting up are going to become very successful as a key part of Scotland's economy going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you to Ivan McGee, MSP, and of course, Sir Ian Wood for that amazing introduction. What a start to the showcase. Uh, thank you very much to all of our guest speakers. Now, hopefully you are sitting at home, you are nice and comfortable and are ready to continue with the showcase today. In challenging times, as the minister has said, creativity and innovation have never been more important. So we are incredibly proud of all of our entrepreneurs for playing their part. This accelerator is part of a diverse and vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem that supports Scotland's can-do vision to become a world-leading leading innovation society for the benefit of all. Now, this might only be the second year of our RG Startup Accelerator programme, but already previous startups have raised hundreds of thousands in additional funding, have went on to create dozens of new jobs and won several national awards. So, uh, no pressure to cohort two. Uh, hopefully you're sitting comfortably. Uh, excuse me, I am being host and presenter from my living room here today, but I'm delighted to be welcoming you. And there's plenty to be taking place throughout this showcase. Throughout the live broadcast, we are going to be showing you pitch videos from our 10 finalists. 
they are competing for four prizes worth £5,000 each. The prizes are Most Improved Award, Best Pitch Award, Most Innovative Idea Award and of course Audience Choice Award. Once you have seen all the pictures you will be able to give your vote at the end of the show and your favourite might end up walking away with £5,000. So the other three prizes that are going to be awarded today, besides the Audience Choice Awards, are being awarded by our esteemed panel of judges. Let's meet the industry professionals and entrepreneurs who will be making today's big decision. So we have a mix of industry leaders, professionals and entrepreneurs all lined up ready to make their decision. We'll be speaking to the judges later on in today's show and as well as our 10 finalists, you can find out more and speak to all of the businesses which were part of the cohort in this event today. On Startup Sunday website, which hopefully you are all on and enjoying, there is a Meet the Cohort 2020 section where you can flick through and read all about the teams, connect with them on their social media or drop them an email and of course watch a short introduction that each team has prepared so please take some time to have a look through that. You can also take part in our live chat room and speak with the other attendees and startup founders. All you have to do is enter a username and click join and you'll already see the startups have been actively typing away so please um, keep an eye on that and you can converse with them and share your reactions those types of things. Now later on in the broadcast we'll be sharing some exciting videos giving you the chance to win £100 worth of Amazon vouchers and we have an exclusive announcement from the principal of RGU. Throughout the broadcast please feel free to share your comments or you know watch along selfies with us by using hashtag Startup Sunday Live or tagging us at RGU Innovation on Instagram or Twitter um, and I could be giving you a live shout out later on the show. Let's see if we could get hashtag Startup Sunday Live trending. Okay, are we ready for our first pitch of the day? Kicking us off, we have Callum and Kim from Colbeg Designs. And as you'll soon see, uh, Colbeg is a family business, so uh, fingers crossed, uh, gloved fingers crossed I should say, uh, that James and Alexander are gonna stay still long enough for you to actually watch the full show. So let us meet Colbeg Designs. What does music mean to you? Some say music is the window to the soul. It evokes memories and emotions. Music brings friends together and sometimes can help you find love. But what about the musicians who bring us these feelings? Whether they play on their own or as part of a band, musicians frequently perform outdoors, with many developing hand pain or even arthritis after years of playing, particularly in colder weather. Who do you know that plays music? Who's reaching out to them? What can we do to help? We're Callum and Kimberly Laurie, co-founders of Colbeg Designs. We are setting out to become a centre of innovation for musicians, starting with Scotland's national instrument, the bagpipes. As an experienced piper myself, I know all too well the dangers of performing in cold conditions and the impact that can have on your hands. To tell my story, we head over to Edinburgh Castle. It's January 2009, the start of the Homecoming Scotland celebrations, and I was piping out in the driving wind and snow for well over an hour. By the time I'd finished my final tune, my hands were almost as blue as the saltire itself. I could barely wiggle my fingers, which naturally impacted on my ability to play the tunes my brain was telling my hands to perform. Today I suffer greatly from finger pain and generally struggle to just keep my hands warm. My story is only one of countless amongst the piping community. By applying modern technology to the centuries-old tradition, we are developing a layer of hand protection and are proud to introduce the Piper's Glove. This will allow the current and future generations of pipers to maintain quality standards before, during and after performances. 
Bagpipers have never been able to fully cover their hands while playing the instrument before, mostly because of the intricate finger movements required. With the piper's glove, we can support musicians who are in the same position as I am now, as well as safeguarding the hands of our younger players, all without compromising on shanter control. The materials we've used allow for breathability, flexibility and sensitivity. The piper's glove comes in a selection of colours, has a bespoke sizing guide and can be customised to include your own logos. Even more, we are committed to using fully recyclable and ethically sourced materials to protect our global community in line with our core values. As a family business, these principles determine the way we work. If we can live our lives by them from the very start, then we'll build a company that has strong ethics and sets a positive example in our communities while remaining true to our family values and having a bit of fun along the way. But what has the early feedback from the piping world of over 100,000 been? We've engaged with numerous bands, soloists and businesses to get a feel for the viability of our product, to get to know our future customers and find out exactly what is important to them. I'd like to share Paul's story with you and the impact that the Piper's Glove may have on his love of playing. I have reached an age where cold days have a huge negative impact on my ability to play. I have tried several methods to help, but to little, well, no success. If your product can give me a few bonus seasons in competition, then you will have uh, much more than a quality product. You will have a priceless gift. We have been able to engage with other leading names in the piping community, some of whom have joined our brand ambassador program and will shortly be part of our initial product testing focus group. This feedback will allow us to enter the market and meet the needs of our target audience, which includes pipers and bands from novice level right through to the very top of competition. We've also been able to form a fantastic team of advisors who provide input on matters including design protection, online sales and international partnerships. With the expert advice we've had from them and through the Accelerator programme, We've been able to take an idea and start a viable business that is going to revolutionise the way musicians protect their hands. We started our marketing activities quite early on in our journey, with a strong online presence through our website and social media channels, and we'll shortly be launching an online shop, alongside listings on global e-commerce platforms and agreements with key distribution partners in the UK and Canada. Once we are able to safely resume public gatherings, we will also advertise at key events, including the World Pipe Band Championships, a landmark competition that attracts over 10,000 pipers to Scotland each year. Once we have delivered proof of concept with our focus groups, we aim to publicly launch the Piper's Glove in August 2020, just in time for the start of the colder months. The Piper's Glove will retail at £17.99, which is in line with our competitors where we sit in that marketplace and will result in gross profit of £10.49 per unit. We have challenged ourselves to introduce 10 new instrument-specific products to the market by 2025 and our growth projections indicate that by then we will be selling in excess of 100,000 units per year, resulting in £1.2 million of gross profit, which we will use to reinvest in new product development, facilitate business growth and create sustainable jobs. Crowdfunding also gives us an option of raising early investment revenue while giving our customers the opportunity to own their very own part of the business. We are passionate about supporting the next generation, the people who will become our nation's musical champions, and it is our ambition to gift every young piper in Scotland with a pair of the Piper's Gloves. We can't do this alone just yet, and will shortly be launching the Your Brand on Their Hand campaign, where businesses will be invited to cover these costs and have their logo featured on the gloves. With thousands of children and young people wearing these at televised events, it's a sure way of getting noticed, as well as showing support for our future musical ambassadors. We've talked about the impact music has on us all and how it can even help us find love. Music has had a huge influence on my life, allowing me to travel the world playing the instrument I love, as well as being a passion we enjoy with our boys, James and Alexander. To be able to support the current and future musicians who bring us such joy is a main driver behind Cold Bag Designs. We can't wait to share the next steps in our exciting journey 
and this priceless gift for musicians with you. Thank you, Callum and Colbeg Designs. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed that pitch. I've got my uh, glove on, although maybe not quite the weather for uh, gloves today. Um, like Callum, our next team is made up of staff from the university. Nimely, Chamath, Kyle are, and the team from Attender uh, have a plan to revolutionise student attendance management. So for the students who are watching, if you think you could get away with signing your name into the class, then think again. Attender have a different plan for you. So let's hear about their business plan. Howdy folks, I'm Kyle and I'm here to talk to you about an exciting new startup which is entering into the attendance management space. Now I know what you're thinking and the words exciting and the phrase attendance management are not usually those that are crushed together. However, I think we can all agree that attendance is a necessary evil, in, in some cases very important. Research has shown that attendance in universities, for example, is linked with mental health. However, despite this, traditional methods of recording attendance face many problems. Students will sign in absent friends and colleagues. Staff will spend long hours entering data, which can be invalidated by even simple mistakes. Handing out a paper sheet or even swiping a smart card can cause unnecessary delays. And management can struggle to have a unified view of resources because recording processes lack departmental consistency. It was on the basis of these problems that we saw an opportunity. And so we've developed a tender. A tender is a real-time attendance solution which helps universities who want to improve their student experience by automating attendance management and reducing human error, unlike paper records. To give a specific example, in a university, a lecturer would be able to begin his class, open up the attender app and register the class is ready for marking, for which students are able to respond to that signal and mark themselves as present. All done in the opening few minutes of class without any need for paper registers. It does all this by leveraging our unique and innovative DBeats protocol which is built on the latest Bluetooth Low Energy technology. So how do we compare to other attendance management solutions on the market? Well, we found pretty favourably. Many of the other solutions tend to lack things that we see as crucial in an attendance management application. Either they require expensive infrastructure changes, or they don't allow for much configuration. One of the things that we found was extremely important was the ability to be offline first and ensure that attendance could be marked in settings where internet connection was not available. And few of our competitors really offer this. Why are we so confident about Tender? Well, we convinced a Tef Gold University, Robert Gordon, a very highly ranked teaching university, and one of the leading timetable providers in the world, Cellcat, to partner with us on a two-phase study. The results from the first phase of the study were overwhelmingly positive. During our pilot study, we captured over 8,000 attendance records from over 920 users in 174 sessions over a one-month period and across two schools in computing and nursing. Economic analysis showed we were saving the university £97,000 a year by removing human data input in error. More than that, we actually de-risked £5.3 million in immigration and international student compliance risks. But then, you don't just have to take our word for it. Why not listen to some of what the students were saying about using a tender? Well, I noticed taking attendance on our mobile devices allowed classes to start quicker than usual. It makes signing in a lot quicker rather than waiting for the sheet to come around. Following phase one of our pilot study, and before we move into phase two, we've made every effort to responsibly listen to what our customer has needed. In particular, this has led to two important changes. 
Firstly, we're following that offline first methodology that we mentioned earlier, ensuring that our attendance management is robust to low internet connectivity. Secondly, we have greatly improved the cybersecurity of our attendance management so that our customers and potential investors can be secure in the knowledge that we are secure with their knowledge. Looking to the future, we will finish our pilot study with the conclusion of phase two near the end of 2020. This will allow us to go to market with a tender in 2021. Following that, we would aim to leverage our connection with Cellcat to attend numerous national and international events throughout the year, aiming to increase our market share. This could hopefully allow us to expand to Cellcat partner universities in the UK through 2021, with an eye to going truly international in 2022. Although the running theme you can see to this market plan is to target universities, we stress that the eventual goal to attend her would be as a one-stop shop or the industry go-to for any attendance management. With remote working becoming increasingly important, it is also our intention to expand our services to cover this and not just location-based events. To support our go-to-market strategy, we have developed a business plan which provides two clear streams of revenue. A tender's customer will pay an upfront payment to cover the configuration and consultation costs necessary to provide them an app which is truly personal to them. Following this, they will pay a yearly subscription fee to maintain attender services. This will cover aspects such as maintenance and further development for updates. So, who are the people actually behind attender? Well, I'm Kyle, the Chief Operating Officer, and it's my job to handle communication with potential customers and investors. Hi, I'm Chamath. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Attender. I will be working towards improving the technology behind Attender to reach a global market. Hi, I'm Nirmali, CEO of Attender. I'm also a research professor at the Robert Gordon University and have an international track record in AI research built over 20 years. I know that the team is your road to success and that is why the Attender team is built on discipline, hard work, critical thinking and creative thinking. And we never underestimate the importance of having fun together. Thank you, Team Attender. Count me in, digitally, of course. Now, before we move on to the next pitch, let's have a look at what you have been saying on social media. Thank you for tagging us and using hashtag Startup Sunday Live to share all your comments. Keep commenting in that chat room and see what we've got going on. So we should have, here we have, oh, we have a tweet from Enterprise at Nest Call saying good luck to our friends and partners at RGU Innovation. We'll be tuned in to hear all the fantastic startups. Coming up later in the show, we have Stuart, um, who is one of the Nest Call students on the program this year. We have another, oh, we have an, oh, an image of my face from Rachel Ironside from Storical. Well done and thank you to RGU Innovation for pulling all of this together. Thank you, Rachel, for watching us live up on the big TV with everyone. Uh, Claudia from the Converge Challenge. Hello, Claudia, supporting at RGU Innovation today um, from the comfort of a sunny living room. Good, nice sunny living room is what we want. Um, hopefully you can take us out on the iPad into the garden and have a, a nice startup sunny Sunday. Um, so, and of course, thank you to Ivan saying how important universities are at this time. Um, we have Joanne Tate from Cohort 1 of our Startup Accelerator saying she's tuning in live to see the pitches and cannot believe it has been a year since Cohort 1. Neither can I, it seems pretty crazy. Um, and I think this might be our last one. We have Susan Laurie um, from uh, Aberdeen Business School saying great start to the event. So let's keep the, the energy up and hopefully we've got some more exciting things to come. Oh, and we've got another one. We have one of our judges, Fiona Godsman is watching live. Um, very impressed with production values. Well, this is live from the living room, so fingers crossed it's all working out okay. So um, thank you all so much for your uh, tweets and comments that we have coming in there. Next up, uh, hopefully you are 
fresh and showered for today's show and you've um, shaken off those lockdown habits, I guess, is, is the next pitch that we're trying to look at because when you went for the shower this morning, maybe you were confronted by a pile of plastic shampoo bottles uh, and our next startup team is on a journey to change that. Let's hear from Anna and Rewind. Woken up and noticed you have a greasy hair. That's not the best start to the day, isn't it? And then you decide to go and take a shower. You wet your hair, you grab your shampoo bottle, you open it to squeeze out the product, but instead you just hear this unpleasant sound. Then being all exhausted, angry, and sad because your hair is wet now, you don't have anything to wash it with, and then you start to look around and you notice how many other toiletry bottles are standing in your shower or your bath corner. So imagine all the plastic wasted in the houses of millions of people around the world. 8 million tons of plastic reach your oceans every year, which is set to multiply by 10 times by 2025. 75% of marine litter is plastic, with the majority being single-use products such as this water bottle. And this is why we decided that this is the right time to start acting. My name is Anna Mitina and I'm the founder and CEO of Rewind. Our idea is to create biodegradable toiletry pots. So imagine the laundry pots you use for your washing machine, just like this one. But instead of detergent inside, you would have a shampoo. And it would look something like our small prototype. So being in the shower, you make the pot wet, wait a few seconds till it starts to dissolve, squeeze out the product, drop the pot down and it will dissolve in the drain. Zero waste. A guilt free wash with our high quality coconut shampoo and conditioner to straighten, repair and moisturize your hair. With our easy subscription service, you always know how many washes you have left until the next pack arrives in your pot. As well as helping to reduce the plastic wastage, we plan to donate a percentage of our annual profits to an eco-friendly charity. Rewind pots are designed to solve a customer's top three problems. The problem of keeping the track of your shampoo, conditioner and body wash usage we would solve by having a subscription service where the customers could choose any day in the month when they would like the pots to be delivered right to their door. The subscription includes 15 shampoo, 15 conditioner and 30 body wash pots. The number of pots in the box would differ according to the amount of days in the month. The issue of having a lot of waste and not knowing how to recycle it would be solved by the pots not causing any waste at all and by that we would also address the global plastic pollution issue. From conducting an initial customer validation we have outlined that our estimated target market is both male and female from 15 to 40 years old who are generally concerned with the environment and don't have enough time in their schedules to track their toiletries usage. They could also be the people who are interested in everything new and innovational and who look into the future. Our target customer could be a young lady who cares about the nature and supports plastic-free products and sustainable businesses and finds it more convenient to shop online. We would target such customers through various social media, including our website, as during one of the research it was found that 45% of teens are online on a near constant basis. Rewind is aiming at a specific market in a highly competitive and growing industry. First and foremost, for the town we have a number of £820 million, which comes from the targeted age group. Secondly, we narrowed the number to £160 million through validating the age group and being eco-friendly. Eventually, considering that the price for the capsule toiletries is more expensive than for the bottled ones, this means that this would be affordable mostly to the people with higher income. Therefore, the quantity of customers shrinks to £4 million and with a possible income of 120 million pounds. The pots will be produced through your triangular supply chain. At the first corner, there is a water-soluble film supplier. The second is the manufacturer of our toiletries recipe. Then both these products would be sent to a factory where they would be combined together. The ready-to-go pots would be distributed and marketed by Rewind. A primary revenue source shall be through business to customer subscription service, with either monthly payments or advance payments for six months or a full year. We will also offer one-time purchases of boxes of pots. Following the growth of our subscription base, additional revenue may be possible 
through bulk orders with business-to-business -business supplies for hotels, service departments, retailers and festivals. Our pricing strategy shall be bundle-based, priced slightly higher than our competitors due to the quality of the product and an environmental impact. Based on competitor analysis, we aim to price the product around £30 for a monthly subscription service and £7.50 for one time purchase for a week. While the toiletry market is competitive with leading brands like Head & Shoulders, Dresim & Schwarzkopf, the wine seeks to compete on the quality and environmentally friendly packaging. These brands use single-use plastic as packaging where the wine would use water-soluble foam. Subscription boxes such as Lavish Bath Box and Zats Club, which include bathing essentials such as shower gel, bath bombs, conditioners and shampoos, are also non-dissolving. Groom produces solid shampoo bars and although it has a subscription service, it's not a bundle deal. Novo doesn't have subscription at all. One significant feature we have is our plan of donating to another eco-friendly organization from our profits. What makes Rewind unique is that we want to be a sustainable, high-quality toiletry business which will finally make changes in the industry. Our plans after the Startup Accelerator program include in the summer continue investigating the market to draw a clear picture of our customer by creating the second in-depth survey. Testing out water-soluble foam which we already purchased from one of our suppliers. Find the toiletries manufacturer who could be our advisor or even supplier. Contacting the detergent manufacturer in Estonia to potentially collaborate on producing the pots. During autumn continue to collaborate with our suppliers in order to create our first real prototype. After that we plan to establish a crowdfunding campaign where all the people who invested would get the first party of our pods and give us the feedback. This will happen around winter time so after processing the comments from the customers and improving the product the final version of Rewind Pods shall be released by the end of winter, beginning of spring followed by the start of the sales. To execute our plans, we have a small but ambitious and ready to roll up the sleeves team. I'm Anna, the founder and CEO. Studying international business management will give me the right knowledge to run the company efficiently by planning out the strategy, finding the investors and recruiting a powerful team. This is the co-founder and CEO of Rewind Denise. She is a chemical engineering student at University of Aberdeen, which will help her to understand the product and develop it. We are open to any new connections and help. Join us on our journey to bring an eco-friendly toiletry solution right to your door. Hey, well done Anna and Rewind. So if it means I don't run out of shampoo pods, then I am keen. So our next team solution might also benefit our oceans, but this time in the oil and gas industry. MZ is looking to tackle issues of corrosion. So now it is your turn, Emmanuel and Roy. Corrosion. This is something we can all relate to as it affects our everyday lives. It is a natural process that occurs when metals rust on exposure to moisture over a period of time. And we see this happen in our cars, bicycles, the bridges we drive on, and also on pipes used to transport our water and hydrocarbons. My name is Dr. Roy Bittrus, co-founder and director at MZ Limited. According to the Oil and Gas Technology Center, Corrosion under installation is a major problem in the oil and gas industry, as the statistics show that 20% of major accidents and 60% of pipework failure are as a result of corrosion under installation. Corrosion under installation has the potential to shut down operations of an offshore platform when the integrity of that asset, such as a pipe, is breached and compromised due to corrosion. To address the issue of corrosion under insulation, we at MZ have come up with a unique intelligent epoxy coat technology that can be applied to the exterior surface of the insulated pipework in order to detect, hinder, and transmit corrosion as it advances on the pipework so as to ensure on-time intervention of the corroding assets. Our solution is a platform technology with the potential of being applied across various industries, such as power, water, and rail industry, 
in a bid to achieve and contribute to the transformation of these industries into the fourth industrial revolution, fulfilling the dull, dirty, dangerous, and dear tasks of monitoring assets. Our intelligent codes will be applied onto the external surface of the pipe, and a strip will be in contact with the coat, which will be placed across the length of the pipe, and connected at the ends to a sensor widget, which will process and transmit signals to a remote system, which will be used to interpret the data and remotely diagnose corrosion. At the start of the RGU Accelerator program, we had not fully qualified the target market. However, through the course of the program, we have been able to validate our target market through a customer discovery process, and we classified our initial target market within the energy industry as primarily oil and gas companies, particularly tier one operators, companies with assets such as refineries and offshore platforms. However, with the recent crash in oil price and COVID-19 pandemic, we are reconsidering our primary target market and now have to bring forward other industry segments within the energy industry that are also currently facing the issues of corrosion. These industries include the renewable industry, particularly the wind industry, as it has been reported that the monopile foundations of wind turbines are facing corrosion which will over time compromise the integrity of the turbines. Our value proposition to our potential clients is to minimize the risk of corrosion by providing real-time online information on discrete points within the assets. We'll save costs by reducing unplanned shutdown and also save time by reducing the frequency of manual inspections. And finally, improve safety of the assets by ensuring timely intervention. The total combined non-destructive testing market is 6.7 billion pounds, which is quite huge, with an estimated market growth of approximately 7%. Our target is to capture 5% of the serviceable available market, which equates to 111 million pounds. We aim to penetrate the market through field trials with potential clients who will be first adopters of the technology, after which we will generate revenue to the sale and licensing of the intelligent coating system to businesses, while offering a subscription package for the data analytics service in the UK, US, Canada, and Middle East markets. So far till date, we have been able to carry out a preliminary proof of concept in the laboratory, which ended in November of 2019. Results have indicated that our unique epoxy can hinder, detect, and possibly transmit the advancement of corrosion. And with that, we plan to take these results and conduct further tests in the lab to fully understand the capability of our products. We, however, need to raise funds starting from February 2020 through to the start of 2021 to carry out trials, develop the prototype, and run the business. And we will be doing this by applying for competitions, grants, and fundraising from angel investors and through paid prototype testing, which we anticipate to start at the third quarter of 2021 and last for six months. The timelines will be revised pending the state of the industry and the end of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have researched our competitors and have discovered that none of them combine anti-corrosion protection and corrosion monitoring together. This is where MZ comes in and differs from the competition. In steering this ship is Emmanuel, who has an MBA and is an experienced corrosion engineer with over six years in the oil and gas sector. And myself, where I bring in over 10 years of experience in business development, sales, and research in the entrepreneurial space. We are also supported by an experienced industry advisor, Innis, and together we are working to develop a viable technology that can effectively monitor and tackle the issue of corrosion. Through the course of this accelerator, we have reevaluated our business model, acquired new knowledge, and networked with seasoned professionals to help develop our idea and technology. We're very much aware of the challenges that lie ahead 
And that is why the support of the RGU Accelerator is paramount to helping us achieve success and great strides. And we hope that this support will continue until our vision at MZ is actualized. Thank you. There we go, that is our first block of pitches. And we know we might be competing with an international space exposition, so don't worry, I have our Thunderbirds here. So if you're thinking about watching the space show, even better. There we go, so have a think about those first blocks of pitches. Are any of them out of this world and worth your votes? You will be able to cast your audience choice award at the end of the pitches. And remember, it is not just the startups who could walk away with money today. Let's hear about the chance you have to walk away with £100. Now we're giving you the chance to get involved and win prizes today as part of Startup Sunday Live. How would you like to have £100 worth of Amazon vouchers to spend in just a few hours' time? That's right, you could be £100 better off just by taking part today. All you have to do is look out for the keyword that will be revealed at some point during the broadcast. Once you spot it, go to startupsunday.co.uk, click the link to the competition and make your submission. Simple. Entries will close later in the show and a winner will be revealed at the end of the broadcast. Keep watching and you never know, this could be you. Good luck and enjoy the show. say if you want to win that £100 then keep an eye out for that keyword on the screen behind me. Now it doesn't mean that any snap breaks you've got to do where it'll have to be a little bit quick and remember to keep sharing your comments with hashtag Startup Sunday Live and tagging at RGU Innovation and all of our startups are in the chat room on the website so continue to chat to them if you've got a question about their idea feel free to message them on there. Now over the past five months we have had the pleasure of working with these teams of students, staff and alumni from both RGU and Nesco to turn their ideas into businesses. From boot camp to lockdown it has been one heck of a journey. Let's have a look back on our highlights from cohort two. Challenging. Informative. Empowering. Worthwhile. Epic. Propitious. Awesome. Inspirational. Energizing. Resilient. Worthwhile. Evolutional. Accommodating. Transformative. Thought. Provoking. Eye-opening. Systematic. Inspirational. Motivational. The RGU Accelerator program definitely exceeded my expectations. You know, I for one came into the program with this idea, but no clue what to do with it. And I started to understand what I'm actually doing. To shape our business ideas with our mentor, critical feedback from experts with business experience. One of the things that I am most proud of is being able to work as a team. <laughs> There you go, good job team! <laughs> Network and communicate with other teams. And I'll come over to Edwin and I'll say, you a condiment? Yay! Yay! The past few months have been very, very eye-opening. The most challenging part for me would have to be the time we took our customer validation. Doing a good job on the tasks allocated in the time given. Made some tweaks and changes, which was a very, very challenging period. The level of detail that's taught and that needs to be learned in such a short amount of time, um, it's quite surprising the amount that you actually do need to get to grips with quite quickly. For me, the funniest moment on the Accelerator programme had to be the music making session we had at the, the start of our first weekend workshop at School Hill. When we were about to deliver our first presentation pitch, I remember that we were all really nervous and we went into a room that was full of drums. That session was the ultimate icebreaker. We spent the whole morning making so much noise and just having so much fun.
craziest thing I've ever been part of. Played our souls away, basically. <laughs> We begin to forget about the pressure and the nerves that we had for our pitch in the afternoon. It was such a great bonding experience and allowed us to really break the ice amongst the cohort. What's the most significant thing that I've learned from being part of the Accelerator program? How to take an idea and very systematically develop a business or organization around it. I've learned how to be proactive. That's because of our mentors who have helped and inspired us to realize and positively act on our potential as a team. It's not to let my perfectionism hinder me. I'm grateful to the EIG team for this opportunity. True development doesn't come from waiting for the perfect moment in order to put yourself out there. It's you trying new things and putting yourself out of your comfort zone. Thank you to our amazing Cohort 2 team. So many memories from drumming to all sorts throughout the whole cohort. And to reflect on their memories, I'm delighted to be joined live by our Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group, Chris, Graham and Sally. Hello team, have a wave. Nice to see you Hi, all. Chris, Hi. Have you got your trousers back, Chris? Doing a great job. Ah, thank you very much. Have you got your trousers back, Chris? <laughs> I have, yes. Oh, Let's wait, see oh. them, yes, there they are. <laughs> okay, that, we're also... I have any reference to uh, anyone that didn't watch the start of this uh, video, but uh, if they want to go back and watch the start, they can. I've also got my popcorn and my Coca-Cola as well. Fantastic. So uh, our EIG team have been watching along live as well. So maybe, Chris, how was the Startup Excel program for you this year? Oh, Edward, it's been an amazing journey. I think we've all got so much from it, you know, these teams started in January. They came to us with some, you know, incredible ideas. They beat 180 other applicants uh, that applied to the accelerator program. Um, they had early stage uh, ideas, early stage businesses, um, and they all came in quite raw. And I think, you know, they 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 went through the process. They learned a lot. They uh, gelled really well as a cohort, uh, and they're really impressive. And and also the way in which they've managed to to meet the challenge of, you know, COVID-19 and the lockdown, you know, they've shown real resilience, they've shown the real entrepreneurial mindset, you know, and they've come out with some, some great businesses that we've seen today. Uh, and, but also they've got the confidence as well. They've got the confidence to go on and make their business a success. It feels insane to think that we started all the way back in January and we never would have imagined the program would have ended up like this. Um, Graham, have you got any particular highlights of the program so far? Hi, Ed. Hi, everyone out there. There's lots of highlights there. Loads of fun things happened. I'd, I'd like to actually take the, take the opportunity to say thanks to all the teams for making our lives easy when the transition had to the digital had, had to occur. You know, so, so fair dues to them for doing that. Um, also, I'd like to, to, to suggest that they also made our life very difficult at that transition in the sense that when we moved over to doing this video competition, it was very hard for us because of the quality of the pitches they put in. They instantly embraced the idea of video pitching. It was very hard for us to make the cut in terms of how many we could show in, in today's event. So I would ask people out there not to do it now, but to remember that there's 21 teams in this. They've all got their little three minute pitches in there. All of these teams are gonna be looking for investors. They're all looking for um, customers at the end of the day, they're all looking for supply chain, they're all looking for interaction from you. So I would, would invite people out there, uh, enjoy the show now, but go back and look at the materials and, and get in contact with these teams. This is not a simulation, these are real businesses that we're looking to create here. Yeah, amazing. Perhaps it, but... <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry at all. Um, and uh, I guess over to, to you, Sally, uh, we are all four mentors to these teams. We, we take these businesses under our wing. Um, have you got any proud moments of, of being a mentor um, from the program? I love the moment when the teams get it. When you see that transformation, that it goes beyond being just an idea into being a real business, and they start leaving you behind as a mentor. That's the bit I love the most. Leaving behind? No, never leave you, Sally. You're always around. Always there to support them. And Graham, uh, how has this cohort compared to last year? Has it been, obviously digitally has been different, but there must be other areas where, you know, it's felt a bit different. 
Well, one word answers very favorably. You know, they've all been as diverse as, as they were last year uh, in terms of diversity of the people in there, diversity of the ideas that we're seeing. I think a new thing perhaps that we spotted this year is that some of the teams, I think we coined the phrase hybrid teams, and that they were staff and student uh, groups that were coming forward. And that was perhaps something we didn't expect, um, but it's very exciting to see nonetheless. I think all of the teams have shown the same level of resilience same level of ambition, with the same level of passion for their respective ideas. So, in that sense, it's business as usual. It's been it's been great. It's been uh, one heck of a cohort. And Sally, an accelerator program is uh, a fixed period of time. We work so hard to develop them in a period of five months, and of course, the support continues. But then, beyond today, this is our sort of graduation ceremony for these amazing twenty-one businesses. What would happen next? What advice would you give to some of these teams, maybe watch, well, definitely watching live, for how they go on beyond the accelerator? Well, I'm just going to remind them of that very old chestnut. The harder I work, the luckier I get. And that's what they need to do next. Keep that hard work going. Fantastic. And I guess finally to, to you, Chris, as well as the teams, uh, this marks the, the end of our second cohort of Accelerator as an entrepreneurship and innovation group. What comes next for, for us as the EIG team? Uh, we're all going to go out and enjoy the sun, I think, over the next couple of days. <laughs> no, um, there's still so much going on. So, you know, we're, we're about to start the next part of the Creative Entrepreneurship Accelerator. We've done a very successful cohort one and Sally's about to lead on that uh, starting very soon in partnership with Look Again. So we had 28 creative entrepreneurs uh, signed up to that. And again, a lot of that's being delivered online. Um, we also have the, the Library Innovation Network Aberdeenshire partnership that we're delivering on in partnership with Live Life Aberdeenshire. Um, so again, that was in the libraries, but now that a lot of that's gone online, but we've got a great partnership with Aberdeenshire to help stimulate and foster entrepreneurship in, in the rural Aberdeenshire, so connecting with the entrepreneurs out there. We're looking to embed and integrate a lot of the activity that we do across the whole of the institution in RGU, working with the schools and the departments to support them, particularly as we go back on, on campus and working with the students to make sure that, you know, they get the best experience that they can. And then, you know, we have our other partnerships with Opportunity Northeast and One Code Base. We obviously have this incredible uh, One Tech Hub in the city centre that we're looking to, to go back to and to kind of make it, make it you know, energise it and flourish it. So there's an awful lot of work to still to be done. You know, we, we, we have our we have our second curve coming up. So we're really, really looking forward to getting stuck into that. Fantastic. Thank you so much to the EIG team. You will see them uh, featured throughout various videos later on in the programme. But uh, a wave goodbye from Chris, Graham and Sally. Thank you very much. Woohoo! Enjoy the popcorn, Chris. Delicious. Uh, so thank you so much for the team. We'll be uh, seeing you all later in the broadcast at some point. But now, as you can imagine, it's time to get back into those pitches. Now, our next team are on a mission to save you money and reduce your food waste. Um, I've so far avoided the lockdown banana bread, but I've definitely got some carrots that could probably use some creative ideas. So here's hoping that Stuart from Nesco and Kim will be able to help out with their business idea, Kairos. Hey, I'm Stuart and this is Kim. Together we run Kairos, where our mission is to encourage you to maximise the use of food in your kitchen and make it easy for you to reduce waste while saving you money in the process. You see, we keep finding ourselves in the kitchen, not knowing what to cook, looking at expired ingredients and then buying food we forgot we already had. You might be thinking, I don't throw out that much. It's just one cucumber. What's the big deal? Well, we looked into it and found that the average UK adult throws out around 210 pounds of edible food and the average UK household throws out around 730 pounds every year. I mean, sure, 730 pounds isn't life-changing, but what would you do with an extra 730 pounds in your pocket? Pay a month's rent? Mortgage payment? Maybe put a dent in your student debts? You can even go into reading for two months with change left over. And did you know, the edible food that we throw out as a country would fill 8 Wembley stadiums and 70% of that is household food waste. Our platform enables our users to help reduce that waste. 
Kairos makes it easy and fun to keep track of what you have in your kitchen, lets you know what you can cook with all the ingredients you have in stock, and motivates and incentivizes you to reduce your household food waste, resulting in a fun, eco-friendly and wallet-friendly experience. You can easily log the items you buy and be notified when it is close to expiry or is running low in stock and be sure you don't buy things you already have. You can discover all the meals you can cook with the ingredients at home. You can gain experience points and coins which you can use in our store for completing challenges including trying new recipes, reducing your individual food waste and staying active on the platform. Now, considering everything that's happened with the COVID crisis, we know people have bought too many products in preparation for the pandemic. And now they're throwing away products left and right that could have been used to make something great. The crisis is also changing consumer purchasing habits as seen by a 25.5% growth in grocery delivery market in 2020. This positioned us in such a way that we have the opportunity to get into this growing market as we scale. The Kairos team consists of myself, Stuart Dyer, the founder, and my co-founder, Kim Johnson, with discussions underway with a potential CTO. I graduated with a Bachelor's of Law from the University of Dundee and a Master's of Law from Queen Mary University of London, which has taught me to critically analyse and strategize for the business, as well as legal considerations for the company. After working in the legal sector, I was offered a traineeship, but didn't see law as my true passion, which is why I left my legal career in order to pursue Kairos. I am now studying visual communication at North East Scotland College, where the skills I have learned have enabled me to design the user interface for a minimum viable product. And I'm Kim. After graduating from high school, I decided to pursue my passion in entrepreneurship, which started with entering and winning the Elevated Challenge in 2016. Since then, I won a ticket to an e-commerce conference in 2019, which was the catalyst for success with my Amazon and Shopify online stores. I learned a lot about social media marketing during this period, which helped me progress from sales to my current position of duty manager at DW Sports. Our target market consists of UK-based 20 to 34 year olds, amounting to around 30 million people or 19% of the population. Our beachhead market is those in that demographic who hold eco or ethical friendly values, which estimates put at just over 8 million people. Our reasons for targeting this demographic are because 1. It is the demographic which has the highest percentage of people who value eco and ethical friendly causes. 2. This demographic is also most likely to pay a premium price if the products they purchase aligns with their values. And three, they would also pay for a service which would save them money in the longer term as well, which Kairos offers due to saving money on groceries. While we plan to explore multiple revenue streams, our initial primary revenue focus is on subscriptions and in-app purchases. We will use a freemium subscription model where we aim to have 2% of our users paying annually and 5% of our users paying monthly, with supplemental revenue coming from in-app purchases made on the Kairos store. Our pricing model puts Kairos at £50 annually or £6 monthly. This is based on evaluating the price point of our competitors with consideration given to the features they offer. However, as our revenue grows from in-app purchases, we aim to reevaluate these price points to be even more accessible to our target audience. Our differentiation from the majority of the competition come from the features we offer which reduce friction for our users, including the barcode scanner and expiry tracker. However, our main differentiating factor at launch comes from the use of gamification mechanisms. Kairos uses gamification to incentivize users to reduce waste, save money and have fun, which our competitors do not yet utilize. Gamification is a rapidly growing market, being poised to reach around £25 billion by 2025. It is especially important for us as there's strong evidence to suggest that gamification can be an effective method at changing nutritional behaviours. We want to utilise this to help our users to eat healthier. Gamification has also been shown to increase user experience and loyalty, as well as increase user engagement and performance. This is why gamification is so important and exciting for Kairos. Finally, after the launch of our minimum viable product, we intend to introduce additional features to further reduce friction for our users, including grocery delivery and machine learning based diet tracking. From there, we intend to progress to our grander vision of entering the health and fitness market by developing a machine learning based exercise planner and community based platform that also use gamification to motivate and incentivize users to reach their goals and live healthier lives. Now, at the start of the accelerator, we had nothing but a huge vision. In these four months, we've managed to take on a co-founder with previous business development and e-commerce experience. We've begun discussions with a potential CTO. We've condensed our huge vision into strategic phases beginning with the launch of our minimum viable product. We've designed the prototype in preparation for launch. 
and we've begun discussions with app development studios abroad and closer to home to make Kairos a reality. You might be wondering, why Kairos? Well, it means the right or opportune moment for critical action. Our platform provides the critical action in reducing household food waste, and now is the opportune time to join us in our journey. So get ready to join us, because not only do we have a huge potential market, we have the ability to scale to other markets as we capitalize on the change in consumer purchasing habits while offering environmental and economic value to society. Thank you for being a part of the critical solution to reducing household food waste. This, this is your Kairos, Kairos moment. moment. See, who needs banana bread? So, from caring for your kitchen and reducing your food waste to caring for your mind. We have all been under a lot of extra pressure with the lockdown, with families, working from home, changes to our lives, and that has a big impact on our minds. Now imagine the mental health impact of childbirth. Our next team of student and staff midwives are on a journey to change that with their business, Relaxation Revolution. What a beautiful image of a happy pregnancy. But this ideal vision is not how all pregnancies turn out. For some, pregnancy becomes a nightmare. I had this nightmare almost every night, waking up in tears, saying to John, my due date will be the last day of my life. In some studies, up to 80% of couples express childbirth-related fear and anxiety. When it comes to the childbirth, these feelings could cause body tension and increase labor pain. As a result, the mother is more likely to choose epidural. Epidural itself triggers a cascade of medical interventions, including need for assisted birth, transfer to operation theater, longer hospital stays, and less satisfaction with the experience. This could impact her mental health. In addition, there are financial costs for the health services. Each epidural and the subsequent interventions could cost up to 2,400 pounds, nearly 10 million pounds per annum in Grampian alone. Knowledge to ease and overcome fear and anxiety of childbirth already exists. However, currently this is not the standard practice and we strongly feel it should be. Our mission is to make this knowledge core to the antenatal care and fill the current gap in the health system. Our mission is to make a difference, to make an impact at the beginning of the life. Who are we? My name is Mo. Geraldine. My name is Claire Walters. My name is Emily Mishosha. Hi, my name is Jade. My name is Barbara. My name is Teresa. I'm Jessica Morrison. Richard Morrison. And this is Oliver Morrison. My name is Ksusha Wisely. My name is Amy. And we together are Relaxation Revolution. We are an award-winning team. I am passionate about Relaxation Revolution as I feel that all women should have a positive and empowered pregnancy and birth experience. I believe that relaxation empowers families. My passion is further developed from witnessing firsthand the joy and beauty that comes from a calm, relaxed and empowered labour and birth. We have been really loyal in our mission in providing education for over 2,800 women and 400 practitioners to date. The education is a part of midwifery program at RGU. We have brought philosophy, psychology, and physiology together. We empower. We inspire. We support people to turn their gaze inward to the powerful resources within. The midwife sent me to the class. It switched the way I was thinking about giving birth. That was the biggest thing. When contraction started, I wasn't terrified in digging my grave. I was happy. I attended a class when I was pregnant and I found it so useful that I just want everyone to be able to access the same information that I had the fortune of accessing prior to giving birth to my daughter. We just had such a wonderful birth experience. I would do it over and over again. We want to normalise relaxation techniques in birth. I feel like it shouldn't be something that we have to proactively research. Mm -hmm. It should be something that's just available. It's something that, that we've applied 
to our lives more generally. It's something that's really changed our perspective on, on what we do. Focusing your mind in a way to, to keep yourself relaxed in a stressful situation has just been an eye-opener for us and something that we really want to share with everyone. Our vision is to roll out a structured education program underpinned by research. We do this by providing pregnancy workshops and training for childbirth practitioners. We will also develop an app to spread the knowledge further and faster. The training for practitioners enhances their mental health and their ability to implement the knowledge in their practice and support families. The antenatal education prompts the mother to take an active role in instilling calmness and control. This reduces fear and anxiety and need for medical interventions, leading to a more positive childbirth experience and a smooth transition to motherhood. It also promotes partners' mental well-being and empowers them to better support the mother. Whilst these parties are the end users, NHS will be the customer, paying for the service and benefiting from a healthier workforce, improved customer experiences and saving costs. Our conservative prediction of 10% fall in epidural use means £1 million annual saving in NHS Grampian alone. This evidence-based program is unique in integrating relaxation in a standard maternity care and including all those involved in childbirth. Such unprecedented holistic approach optimizes the impact. Over the last seven years, we have researched and evidenced the program impact and feasibility with over 2,800 women and 400 practitioners. Relaxation Revolution was born as a more than profit social enterprise. Our Jewish startup accelerator program has given us the confidence to accelerate our innovation. Due to COVID-19, all antenatal classes have been cancelled. Therefore, we are bringing forward our website launch to provide charge-free online education in order to serve the community and raise our profile. As NHS Grampian have already expressed interest, within the next two years, we will deliver the program in this trust with £50 per birth for the service, an annual birth rate of 6000 we expect an annual turnover of 300 k leaving an annual net saving of 700 k for the trust. The program will be scaled to other NHS trusts across Scotland, UK and internationally. The impacts of reducing anxiety through relaxation goes beyond the immediate cost savings during birth. It improves family experience and child development, impacts that last a lifetime. We believe every child, just like Oliver, deserves the best start, and that history will judge us by the difference we make. Our social enterprise revenue streams will make the knowledge more widely accessible and will support the research on maternal mental health. If our mission and values resonate with you, we invite you to join us. Get in touch. Let's do what's right for every mother, every family, every child. This is our mission, a relaxation revolution. Thank you to Relaxation Revolution. Now, before our next pitch, we see you've been actively hashtagging Startup Sunday live on Twitter and Instagram. So let's have a look to see who's watching live and what you've been seeing on social media. So up next, we have uh, Dr. Narbo Faizo from cohort one of our Startup Accelerator. And um, well done to all the team members who helped organize this event today. Some of the early pictures looking great. Thank you, Faizo. Um, Faizo's from Dfinger from last year's cohort. Uh, we have Sarah Hillier from the uh, Business and Economic Development team say well done to Callum from the BEAD team uh, for the first pitch of the day. So well done from his uh, colleagues in the department. Next up we have Chelsea, one of our uh, interns who worked with us planning events for us. Chelsea says, Startup Sunday Live is happening now. Good luck to all the teams. You've worked so well. Well done to the innovation team for pulling it together. Thank you very much Chelsea. Hope you are safe and well at home. Um, Archangel Investors Limited are watching live, looking forward to hearing the pitches today at Startup Sunday Live. Well done, Innovation, for coordinating. Uh, Emmanuel, our student president for education and welfare, hello to the student union team. He's saying watching from the comfort of his room while attending virtual Sunday service. So a bit multitasking there. Well done, great start, very interesting ideas. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. 
Um, and we have Joanne Tate from our uh, previous cohort, an engineering um, lecturer commenting on our engineering startup from NZ. So thank you very much, Joanne Tate. Uh, Xi'an from Archilink, uh, from our previous Startup Accelerator cohort, saying, doing a great job, guys. Looking forward to the full day ahead. Thank you very much to Xi'an. And we have Deborah Burnside, who, if I remember right, uh, I believe is from Armark, the catering company on campus, saying, uh, enjoying Startup Sunday in the sunshine. Good luck to all the finalists. Yes, I'm uh, caved in my living room with all the curtains shut, but I'm looking forward to getting out into the sun. Um, and hopefully some of you are getting the chance to watch live in the sunshine. So uh, not so bad for a Sunday. And uh, we have Teddy Topi from one of our startup teams uh, from EcoBrush watching live all the way from Nigeria. Hello to Nigeria. And uh, we have uh, Shihan also saying, looking forward to the day ahead. Uh, so there we have it. That's our social media. Keep messaging in and remember you can chat to the startup teams if you have questions in that chat room down at the bottom. And remember you are looking out for the keyword that shows up on the screen behind me for the audience competition. Hope you haven't forgotten about it. You could be walking away with £100, but make sure you keep watching to figure out when that keyword comes and you only have a few pictures left until then you get to choose who wins the Audience Choice Awards. So our next team is also looking to share and connect on that social media level, uh, but specifically for the creative community. Robin, Mark and Ian are staff and students from Grace School of Arts. And now it's time to hear about their business, Skim. Hi folks, uh, we're Skim and we're going to tell you about our business idea. So I'm Robin, I am the CEO of Skim and I also study communication design at Grace School of Art in Aberdeen. I'm also employed as an in-house designer at a company called Robert Atkins, which is also based in Aberdeen. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm Head of Customer Experience. and I'm also a communication design student at Grace School of Art. And I'm Ian Gill. I'm Head of Strategy at Skim. I've got over 15 years of creative agency experience from owning, directing, and I'm now a consultant and lecturer at Grace School of Art. There's so many sources of content out there for creatives. There's YouTube channels, there's blogs, there's websites, there's LinkedIn groups, there's LinkedIn posts, there's Facebook groups, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, there's so many sources. It's noisy out there. And for creatives, staying on top, it's hard. Skim is a platform for creatives that distills and creates creative news and knowledge. People, places, spaces, creative work, inspiration, festivals, news, events, blogs, tools, advice, you name it, all your creative content in one place. The app will feature content from a variety of different creative disciplines, such as uh, design, art, architecture, fashion, photography, film, videography, illustration. Basically any type of creative can use our platform and find access to the content that they need. It's a place for creatives by creatives to find stuff, share stuff, make stuff, do stuff. It's like a survival guide for all of the inspired, like your creative kit. The core features of the app will be daily news and articles, building uh, communities and encouraging them to collaborate with each other, access to events, jobs, competitions, festivals, etc. and aggregated social feeds all in one place. So this is a global market and we see there being three types of customers, students, professionals and businesses. There's over 30 million students currently studying creative-led discipline courses globally and there's over 30 million professionals working within the creative industries. Beyond that, we've got over half a million creative agencies building a creative economy and that creative economy is worth an estimated $500 billion globally annually. That is more than double what it was 10 years ago. Our revenue will be based on a freemium subscription model. There will be a free account, a professional account and a business account. The free account will be aimed at students and graduates and young creatives. They'll have access to limited features and there will be advertising. The professional account will be aimed at creative professionals. They'll have access to additional features and content. They'll have no limitations and there won't be any advertising. We expect the conversion rate between a free account and a professional account to be between 1 and 5%. Beyond those two accounts, we'll launch a business account and that business account will offer additional features to businesses where they can post jobs and access the latest talent. Beyond subscriptions, we see additional revenues like advertising on our platform. Digital ad spend 
by 2023 is predicted to reach $517 billion. We think that our well-defined demographic within this platform will appeal to certain companies like Apple and Adobe, LinkedIn, Google, etc. Beyond advertising, we'll be looking at job advertising and job post listings. There'll be affiliate and referral sales revenue streams, whereby we'll get a percentage from some of our advertisers for any products or services that people buy. We'll also look at content sponsorship for areas within the platform. Lastly, there'll be paid competition entries. Route to market. Our market and plan will focus primarily on utilising existing social platforms like Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. We will utilise influencers as content creators, so we will have people create content for us. These influencers will be second to third tier with around two to three thousand followers. And for each of our creative genres featured on the platform, we would like to partner with a social influencer. We will also like to run PPC campaigns and connect with partners like Higher Education, DNAD and YCN. This would not only help us grow our following through engaging with theirs, but it also means we get content created for us that is relevant and valuable to our customers. Competitors. There are a number of platforms that create and curate creative content. Blogs, websites, platforms like Instagram, as well as resources, all currently engage the creative community. We believe that this not only shows the level of readership that's out there, but also the amount of options that people have and highlights the level of noise that there is. So if you only had half an hour each morning to catch up on your news, what platform would you use? This demonstrates how valuable it would be to have a platform that not only gives you the most relevant content, but the very best content for you. Yes, there's competition when it comes to news and inspiration, but we're not here to do that. We're here to round all that information up and distill it and give you one place that's your go-to every morning. Next steps. Just now, we're finalising the brand and the positioning. We're also refining the UI and UX and developing our advertising concept. Going through to June, we would like to be beginning to work on a prototype development as well as identifying our social influencers. Then going into September, we hope to engage our social influencers as well as launch a freemium beta platform and also attract sponsorship and advertisers. And in March, we want to roll out premium and business accounts. Thanks for taking the time to listen to our business idea. And in light of everything that's gone on recently with the current pandemic, it's important now more than ever before that we make sure that there's an online space for communities to collaborate with each other, share, connect, create, and just be. Thank you. Thank you to Skim. Now, as you can tell already, choosing your favourite team is going to be a very hard decision. Three more fav uh, team pitches are going to be going ahead. Now remember, you still have the chance to enter our audience competition and win £100 worth of Amazon vouchers. And you are looking out for that key word. Hint, hint. Okay, so it was about halfway through the programme this year that things changed completely. Lockdown was introduced, the campus was closed, and we've had to respond quickly. Do we cancel the programme or move online? And as you've heard from Ivan McGee already, it was based on the amazing attitude, determination, hard work of our entrepreneurs that we decided to continue with the programme online. Since March, none of the EIG team or the startup teams have met, none of the judges have met, and this whole process has been put together at a distance. We've all had to adjust a little bit to that life at home, so we thought our, we'd share our story of what Cohort 2020 has looked like in lockdown. Hi everyone, Callum from Colbeg Designs here. This is our lockdown diary. A typical day in the life, if you will. Hey, this is uh, Theo Dunas, and here's how we deal with the pandemic. Lots of computers, lots of work, and lots of coffee. This is my workplace during lockdown. Not quite the same as the office, but at least I get to have a friend come to work with me every day. This is Rebel, our 12-year-old lab. I think he's really happy to have me at home. This is Cobag Designs HQ. 
also known as the kids playroom. One chair, one desk, one pirate carpet. This is my working from home station, which is my mum's dining room table. There she is behind me doing the dishes. Yeah, then I'll turn you around to show you my sketchbook. There's my laptop and there, uh, yeah, there's my glass of water. This is how I wish I'd spent the lockdown. This is how I spend my day working since the lockdown, with my dog constantly in my face while I'm trying to achieve good work. Hmm, need a trim. Mm -hmm. Don't we? Mm -hmm. But anyways, we must get on, we must stay resilient, and we must work hard. So a scalable solution for something like this looks like a K8 cluster, a couple different servers, and a reverse proxy to tie them all together. How do you much do you think that's going to cost? You're no health at all, are you? So one of the ways I've been keeping sane and um, happy during lockdown is spending time with um, my little buddy here, Gandalf, who is my two-year-old pet rat, and is now desperately trying to get away. So we are out on our daily walk. Give us a wave for the camera. Uh, so this is our daily exercise during quarantine. So we are we are out with a dog, uh, actually down by RGU in the river. There we go, puppy. Hi. Yes. Ah. <laughs> so, so. I'm still working as well as setting up the business with my role in RGU's business and economic development team, keeping me very busy during the day with Colbeg designs coming to life in the evenings and at the weekends. It's half past four in the morning and uh, growing up my mum and dad always used to say if you don't stick in you're going to end up as a bin man or stacking shelves at Tesco's. Fast forward after a master's degree and uh, running two businesses and I'm actually at Tesco's and I couldn't be more delighted. Um, I applied for a job at the start when uh, I lost all my work and it's uh, given me a huge sense of purpose and uh, somewhere to belong so it's been uh, <laughs> An absolute great journey and uh, it means I can uh, help out during this difficult time too. I'm joined here in HQ by my wife and fellow co-founder of the business, Kim, and our two boys, James, who's three, and Alexander, who's just four months old. I must say, I'm loving getting to see so much of them at the moment. And if things do get quiet here just for a minute, I can, then I can always pop upstairs for a quick puzzle or 10 minutes of Paw Patrol. We're doing our best to keep the boys busy with our daily walk around the street and football in the garden. We're making the best of it, just the same as everyone else. Rita! Oh! <laughs> Anyway guys, that's a quick tour of the desk and a, a day in the life of me, so keep safe, take care, and see you all soon. Thank you so much to our amazing founders for their positivity and resilience. We are one big Archie family and hopefully it feels like that today as part of Startup Sunday Live. Uh, we hope you are enjoying the show so far. Um, keep messaging, keep enjoying the sunshine, keep the chat room going and keep tweeting and following us. We still have plenty more to come. So to keep you interested, here is what you still have to look forward to. And still to come on Startup Sunday Live, We'll have more startup pitches, this time from Storical, Knitit and Ampa. We'll be sharing our highlights on other EIG programmes we've run this year. Voting will open for the Audience Choice Award where you can decide which team walks away with £5,000. It's the last chance for you to enter our competition to win £100 worth of Amazon vouchers yourself. And if that wasn't enough, we're still going to have bloopers from this year's videos, a special message from the principal of the university and of course, the announcement of the winners. 
Don't go anywhere. Ah, so much more to come and your chance to vote too. Now, although it's going to be quite tricky to judge, um, you still have the chance to pick those favourites. So keep an eye on it, keep chatting to those teams. Now, speaking of judges, we are now joined by two of our panel of judges. We have Joe McSween, former CEO of global haggis brand McSween's, and Duncan Reock, associate partner at EY, and of course, Chris Moore from our EIG team. So let's have a look. Hello, meet the team. Hi, nice to see you both. Hello. How are you both doing? Very well, thank you. Fantastic. Good, thank you. Really impressed. Thank you very much. Now, maybe Duncan, I'm going to come to you first. So how did you find the experience of judging as part of this process? Yeah, well, um, thank you for having me on. I hope everyone is safe and well. Um, I really enjoyed working with the judges, coming to the decisions. Uh, we had a lengthy Zoom call last week to discuss everyone in the cohort. And to judge the candidates purely on the content of the videos, I think, was extremely tough. Uh, we would have all loved the chance to interrogate the teams in more detail. But I, I suppose this is a true reflection of life in the business world right now, as we're all adapting to using technology in our businesses to win clients and customers. And it's just a difficult environment to do that. So there was a really healthy and constructive debate across the judges. I very much enjoyed hearing everyone's perspectives. Uh, we definitely had some differing views, Ed, I would say, uh, some strong opinions in there. Uh, but I also enjoyed part of that process of whittling the cohort down to the eventual winners that we all felt comfortable with. Uh, Joe did a very admirable job in chairing our Zoom call, I have to say. Uh, so, and, and I would say as well, this is a great program built by Chris, Sally, Graham, and uh, and everybody in the faculty. So, great credit must go to the whole team at RGU to promote innovation, and of course, all the coaching that goes along with that. And and congratulations to you, Ed, for uh, for hosting today. You're doing a grand job. Thank you very much. Now, uh, for those watching at home, you may be interested to know that the judges have met in advance uh, to decide these pitches and they have their winners. So obviously judges don't give any clues away next. Now, Duncan, you spoke about the process of coming to that. Joe, what was the process that the judges used to kind of come to that decision? Well, we obviously had um, the, you know, the pitch brief and um, quite a clear outline of scoring to follow, which we, we used and that was very helpful. Um, but obviously, as Duncan's just said, there was some final tussling to do because um, we got quite passionate about the ones that we felt very strongly about. And um, so I think when it came to the final crunch, uh, we, we felt, well, which pitches are really going to use the prize money to best effect? Um, so that, that was kind of the, the crunch factor. It wasn't just enough for us that it was a, a slick pitch. Um, confidently delivered, important that that is, it really needed to persuade us that this money was going to be well spent. That's, that's where our conscience got us, I think. Yeah, that seems like a, a fair approach to the judging. And uh, Duncan, I guess, uh, without giving too much away, is there anything that made a team in particular, or the teams that are that shone to attention the most, what made them stand out? Not necessarily the winners, but the, the ones that you looked on favourably. Yeah, so, well, congratulations to all the finalists. Uh, I think to come this far in just a five-month period for all of them is a, is a massive achievement. Uh, in terms of what made the team stand out, uh, I love seeing the passion and commitment showed by all the finalists. Mm -hmm. uh, what really came across in the videos is that they're all bursting with ideas. Uh, for me, I watched the videos, I suppose, with two questions in mind. Uh, Number one, would I buy this product? And number two, would I invest uh, in this business? So there were a few things that we focused on as judges. Um, one was clarity of message. Those that delivered that clearly and early in the presentation certainly made me sit up right away and pay, pay attention to the detail behind mm. those messages. And those with high energy and self-belief also stood out. Uh, and it was fantastic to see those that clearly understood their market uh, and the application of their product. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And this uh, pitching competition, I guess, today, although in a virtual format, uh, will be one of many that these startups are going to go on. We always try to say that 
Um, for those who aren't successful, and including those who didn't get through to the final, it's not a no at the moment. It just means there's still more to be done, and we try to um, encourage them. Joe, maybe have you got any advice or tips for what the next steps some of these startups could be taking to improve for the future? Yeah, I was thinking back to my time at Max Sween, and you know, we um, when I was MD there, we were innovating a lot of new products. Um, you know, one in 10 of our ideas made it to market and that apparently was good going. So we, we failed a lot. Um, and I think what I pass on is what, um, what you must do is, is lean into the biggest challenges or as we call them death threats um, and, and do these as quickly as possible. And there's three main areas that the teams need to focus on in my view. Uh, work through the practical realities of your product or service the profit reality, you know, are you really going to make money? Are you going to be able to pay yourself? Entrepreneurial poverty is a big issue. And if it's a B2B product, are your customers going to make money? And finally, um, what about the customer promise or appeal? And, and keep rapidly looking at, at all three of these areas and trying to find um, a, a death threat and then focus on that because we tend to focus on the easy stuff, but really you should be focusing on the challenges. Um, otherwise it becomes a very linear process and then you find the problem almost at, at, at market stage, um, launch stage, and it's too late then. So you've got to do this rapid spin cycling. And when we started doing that, uh, we, we managed to get rid of non, non-starter ideas much faster. Thank you. And maybe very briefly, uh, Chris is also on the call. Um, I'm going to put him on the spot because one of the awards is obviously most improved. And while the judges have made that decision, uh, the EIG team have kind of contributed a little bit, I guess, in their thoughts. Uh, Chris, any brief reflections on how how to assess that most improved one? They've all been on a, on a journey, Ed. And I think, you know, we saw some of the talent coming in in January. And, you know, we, we have impressed upon them some tools, some methodologies, some frameworks, some, some mentoring, some, some coaching. You know, they've been working with Gordon McConnell and Thor Holt. And, you know, we wanted to see who, which one of those teams uh, were going to, to develop the most and really, you know, put in as much as you get out into that journey. Um, and I think that, you know, we wanted to reward those individuals or those teams that had come the furthest in that short amount of time, that have taken on board, that have listened, that have had that coachability, um, but have also grown in confidence. You know, they come into this with an idea um, and, and, and maybe lack some confidence. And I think what we've seen over the past five to six months is them growing in their own self-belief that they can go out there and make this happen. And I think that was coming through in a number of the pictures. And I think that judges, mm-hmm. I'd just I'd like to personally thank all the judges, not just the judges, for the final, but all the judges that also judged the initial 180 applications that we had were judged um, to, to choose the people that came into the accelerator program. So I personally like to thank all the time and commitment that we've seen from all those people that have been judges as part of this 2020 accelerator cohort. Thanks, Chris. And just very briefly back to Joe and Duncan, I guess, Duncan, uh, beyond the accelerator program, how can the startup teams keep developing? What, what should they be doing? So yeah, I've uh, I've worked with and interviewed a large number of successful entrepreneurs over the years, and and I suppose there are a number of themes that come out time and time again in my discussions. Uh, you know, there's an obvious thing of having a product that people want and having the ability to sell it, but you know there is something there's an X factor needed, uh, and and that you know to become a successful business doesn't come in a in a magic potion. So it's important to recognize that you won't always get it right the first time. Uh, as Joe said, you make mistakes. Um, it's vital that they evolve and adapt uh, to the conditions. And um, Most entrepreneurs will give me a wry grin when I ask these questions. Um, and, and almost all of them will say that they've made loads of mistakes in their careers. Uh, but the really successful entrepreneurs will learn valuable lessons from those. So the cohort should not be afraid of making mistakes, uh, recognize that that will just be part of their journey, uh, but take calculated risks along the way. And Uh, and the last thing would be something Sally mentioned, I think in her advice, is just hard graft, hard graft, hard graft. Uh, You know, it's to be successful will take hard work, blood, sweat and tears to get where they want to be, but the rewards are ultimately worth it for those successful entrepreneurs. 
And uh, finally to yourself, Joe, uh, judging digitally is quite difficult. Any reflections on that or on the process overall? Um, I've quite enjoyed it, actually. I mean, my, my whole life has, has gone online. It's, it's saved an awful lot of time. I live a long way from Aberdeen. Um, I feel um, the quality of our discussions was, was just as good, um, actually. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think actually just because we're living in such challenging times, I think constraint forces a lot of uh, creativity. And I would say to all of the entrepreneurs that are part of this, if your business can, can, can succeed now, my goodness me, you're going to have a great career ahead of you because this is some of the toughest conditions ever. So um, there's never been a better time to launch a business as far as I'm concerned. And I definitely echo um, Duncan's um, point about hard work. And I think what must be stressed is take care of yourself. You need a lot of resilience to do this. The knocks are painful. So make sure you look after your mental and physical health um, um, so that you stay resilient. Um, and uh, have, have, thing, have, you know, celebrate your milestones. Um, now that I'm self-employed, every time I want a client, I opened a bottle of champagne. So, <laughs> um, so whatever that is for you, um, make sure you celebrate the milestones. Thank you so much. Thank you, Duncan and Fiona uh, and Joe. Sorry, uh, a wave to yourselves. Thank you so much. Bye and, and, and well done. Brilliant show. Thank Loving you the energy. Much. And uh, speaking speaking of Fiona, uh, we will be going to Jared, Fiona, and Mike, who are other judges later on in the show. So now let's move on to our final three pitches. The next team includes staff from both our School of Cre Computing and our School of Creative and Cultural Business, and is looking to change the way we see the world through the power of stories. So I'm going to move over to you. What do you see? The sea, land, mountains in the distance? Perhaps you notice the small islands or wonder where we are. This is a beautiful place, but also a place of stories. Because behind every place, every landscape, every object is a story. However, we often miss out on the smaller ones, hidden in the communities, language and history of the places that we visit. Because all objects and places have history, and all that is historical has a story. But imagine a world where it was possible to find these stories, and to hear more about the wonderful places that we visit, or even our homes. And what if there was an easy way to share our own stories, so that we could create a world for friends, families and all story seekers to explore. We would like to introduce you to Storical, our story, and we hope someday yours too. Storical is an online digital platform that allows you to easily collect and craft stories using drag and drop functionality and a variety of customizable templates that you can shape to your style, brand and preferred delivery, whether that be text, audio or visual. Uniquely, Storical then provides the ability for you, as storytellers, to create compelling story experiences by linking story templates to create outdoor story trails and indoor story exhibits. Outdoor story trails link stories to locations using GPS technology so that you can encourage visitors to explore cities, towns and the country. Indoor story exhibits can link stories to rooms and objects using beacons or simple room templates, providing the opportunity to create new and exciting story experiences for indoor attractions. Your story experience will be published on our historical platform, which will be available on all web and mobile devices. For your visitors as story seekers, it's a bit like having a tour guide in your pocket. Our story is just beginning. Let me introduce you to our team, who are working hard to bring Storical to life. Stuart, our tech gatekeeper. I've experienced working in large multinationals and leading successful startups. My recent focus has been on innovation, developing data-driven AI solutions. I'm also our interim CEO, where we seek for someone with a strong digital publishing background. Hi, I'm Glenn, our tech wizard. I'm experienced in software development and producing networked application solutions for online startups. Hi, I'm Rachel, a story master, and I have a background in storytelling and research. I also have experience in marketing, strategy, and tourism-based startups. 
Our journey started developing digital heritage trails for National Museum Scotland and Heritage Scotland, and last year we created our first story experience, the Orkney Folklore Trail. We realised that there is not a simple way to create sustainable story trails that link stories to locations or objects in an engaging way, without technical expertise. This makes creating these trails expensive and difficult to preserve and maintain. Like online curation tools such as Squarespace and Weebly, Storical provides a platform that can be used by anyone. Simple drag and drop functionality makes creating story trails easy. Micro learning provides tips on how to create compelling experiences and editability ensures that you can change previous trails easily and add new ones. This means that unlike current products on the market, we're able to provide a much more customised, cost-effective and sustainable solution. And there's more. At its heart, Storical believes in the power of communities to share compelling and authentic stories. Our platform is built on these stories and we want to give back to those communities that share their stories through us. That is why we are a community interest company, where funds brought in by investors, organisations and individuals that use our platform will go towards subsidising credits for the use of Storical by schools, educational and community groups. By helping us to grow our story sharing platform, you in turn help others to learn about, enjoy and share their own stories. And we think that's very exciting. We believe that Storical provides a transformational way for organisations to tell stories and believe that our platform will appeal to storytellers in heritage organisations looking for ways to share story exhibits and trails around their sites, destinations looking to engage visitors with places in new and exciting ways and research organisations and community groups who want to create sustainable story outputs. Our primary B2B market will focus on heritage sites, which we estimate in the UK alone to have a potential market value of over 90 million. Customer research has shown us that a subscription model will be most suitable for this market. We will charge £20 per month per site, which will provide the ability for our storytellers to create, edit and maintain multiple story trails and exhibits. For our story seekers, Storical will be free to use and with over 192 million heritage trips made to the UK alone each year, that could be a lot of Storical adventures. How big do we think Storical can get? Well, how many stories would you like to tell? In our first year, we would like to appeal to story seekers and storytellers across the UK and Ireland. In year two, with the addition of multilingual functionality, we would like to grow to Europe and the USA. In year three, we intend to expand globally. We are on a mission to create a world of accessible and compelling stories. By year three, we aim to have over 5,000 storytellers subscribed, leading to an annual revenue of over 1.1 million and a profit of over 550,000. And with that many storytellers, we aim to bank over 60,000 pounds worth of story credits for local communities. We would love to bring you on our historical journey. This year, we have secured funding through the RGU Accelerator Programme and applied to Converge Challenge. And by the end of this year, we aim to gain a further £50,000 to provide you with the basic tools to collect, craft and publish story trails. In years two and three, we want to grow the historical experience to incorporate a data analytics dashboard, multilingual translation, personalised trail recommendations and gamification options. We also intend to build partnerships in this period for future growth. If we can help you to share your stories, or if you would like to work with us to build a world connected by stories, then give us a holler. We would love to hear from you. Now, sticking to that theme of stories, we probably all have a story of our family member putting some love and attention into knitting something special for us. I had a look, here is a cushion my granny knitted me for me for my new flat. Um, so we all have our next, our, our comfort items knitted from our families. And our next founder wants to bring knitting to the modern age. And I think they surprised us all when we walked into the Mentor Mashup and Graham, Sally, Chris and me got to see a knitted version of our faces. Um, certainly was a bit of a surprise. So let's see if Lucy can inspire you to pick up your needles with her business idea, Knit It. Lucy from 
from Knit It and I'm going to talk to you about knitting. In the last decade, knitting has seen a resurgence and even more so in the last few months. Campaigns like the Innocent Smoothie Big Knit saw millions of us pick up our needles and start knitting. And our innovation is perfect for this new growing market. Knitting inspires creativity. It reduces stress and gives a sense of achievement. It's the perfect guilty pleasure for a self-isolating society. I've been raised around knitters. My mum's a knitter. My grandma too. Knitting is love, you see. People putting their time, their care, their effort into crafting a gift for their loved ones. Think back to your grands. Did they spend hours knitting you a jumper to wear? But have you ever tried to knit yourself? Here are some of the problems that knitters face. I find terminology and abbreviations difficult. Patterns are hard to follow and I always lose my place. I get so confused with conversion and sizes. I'm forever having to stop my knitting and pick up my pattern. My dogs always chew my patterns and they get spilled on and crumpled. My grandma's in isolation so I have no one to teach me how to knit. When I make a mistake, I don't know how to fix it. My patterns are messy because I have to scribble all over them. I need a magnifying glass because the writing's so small. All of these problems cause frustration and make each knitting project twice as long and cumbersome. But we have the antidote to that frustration. We are revolutionising the way people enjoy their craft by reinventing knitting patterns. We empower knitters and newbies alike with digital knitting patterns using interactive tools and a modern approach to make finding, following and sharing patterns easier than ever before. And to show you how it works, Mari has been using Knitted. So she uses our pattern library and community feed for inspiration. She downloads a digital pattern to her account and she can view it as written instructions, pictorial grid or both. She can filter size information, conversions and components giving her one simple zoomable set of instructions. She tracks the progress of each row, seeing where she is at a glance. She can even swipe so she never loses her place again. If she's multitasking, she can tap for audio dictation, meaning that she doesn't have to stop and think. And if she's stuck, she can tap for a tutorial video from her YouTube channel. Exactly the help she needs, right there on her screen. No more Googling, knit it, makes knitting easier, more accessible, and much more enjoyable. But not only that, Knit It will grow a community of passionate knitters, all connected by the platform. And even cooler than that, with a simple tap, she can now order a digital knitting pattern of her own photograph, the Knit Pick. We are targeting every single knitter and every single person who's ever considered taking up knitting. In the UK, there are 7.8 million knitters and a total of 69.8 million in English-speaking countries across the globe. Crafts are the fastest growing creative industry, contributing to 420 million. And Google Trend searches for knitting have increased by 53%. In the past five weeks alone, due to the pandemic, one of our competitors, Stitch & Story, reported an 800% increase in sales. In fact, even our customer discovery, we've already accumulated in excess of 100 people keen to start using our platform. You see, modern knitters need a pattern that speaks a digital language. We now have a generation that expect and rely upon computerised interfaces for everything. A staggering 77% of knitters have learned a new skill on YouTube. A 46% have shared a finished project online. So we know knitters are seeking a digital solution. And this is what Knit It offers. We incorporate digitalisation, interactive tools and social media and there's nothing quite like it out there. Our beachhead market will focus on the UK and target hobbyist knitters, mainly female, aged between 12 and 55. Our secondary market will target the 35 to 55 year olds. And now down to the nitty gritty. Our business model has multiple revenue streams. We will operate a premium model to entice users into an annual subscription. We will also have independent sales of digital nitpick patterns. And as the business grows a steady user base, we intend to create partnerships with pattern designers and with charities to create digital knitting appeals where our community can knit for good causes. The business will also see revenue from our tutorial videos on our YouTube channel. 
In our team, we have a finance manager with 30 years of consultancy experience and seven years running her own successful startup. A brand strategist with experience building his own brand, overseeing our marketing strategy. A web developer who is currently building a wireframe prototype of a music platform within the accelerator funding budget. And an advisory board of experienced business professionals. And it doesn't hurt that our founders are mother, daughter and grandma with an inherited passion for knitting. So now you know what we're building and why we're building it. And we've already come such a long way. Just four months ago, we didn't even have a name. Now we have achieved a place on the RGU Acceleration Programme, founded our company, met with lots of experienced mentors, even knitted them, developed our branding, established our company values, and conducted customer discovery. We've also begun developing the first version of our website and have a developer working on our minimum viable product. We have plans to run a summer campaign to launch the nitpick patterns and collect the database of key knitters and beta testers. By Christmas, we aim to launch the Knitted platform. We are looking to raise a minimum of £50,000. The majority will be spent on web development of version 2 of our minimum viable product. The rest will be spent on our grassroots guerrilla marketing strategy and operating costs and equipment, which will allow us to do this in-house and bring us towards our first 100,000 users. We are going to change the way people knit. So follow our story on Instagram at Hello Knitting and visit our website to register your interest. And now, all that's left to say is... So oh, oh, stay home, stay safe and start knitting. Thank you, Lucy and Knit It. We are almost at the end of the pitches so far. Um, if you have liked any of these teams, now obviously in a few minutes you'll be opening the votes for the Audience Choice Award, but you can connect with them. Make sure you go to Meet Cohort 2020 and there is little videos from all of the different startup teams. You can also find their social media and emails there. So if you want to reach out to them, then please feel free to do that. Now, before we move on, uh, I'm delighted that you've still been tweeting and social mediaing us. So let's have a look to see what we've got here. So I'm just going to pull up our social media and um, to have a look to see who has been tweeting in and we have uh, Elizabeth Gammy, our head of Aberdeen Business School has messaged so she's out in the sun sunshine some great scalable viable ideas she said there we also have Hal from the RGU marketing department said blown away by what my colleagues at RG Innovation have pulled off at Startup Sunday Live the quality is outstanding Thank you very much, Hal. Thank you for all of the help from the RGE team for making this possible. Uh, we have uh, Dikachi watching Startup Sunday Live, impressed with the pitches. Uh, a bit of bait oatmeal whilst watching Startup Sunday Live. Uh, so impressed by the entries. That's from Kudzai, so thank you so much for watching. Uh, we have Izuru, Startup Sunday Live is going great. All the love from Sri Lanka. Hello, Sri Lanka. Thank you for tuning in. Hopefully the time difference isn't too bad for you. Um, we have Rachel Ironside, Gandalf, yes, Gandalf the Rat is famous. Welcome to Gandalf on our highlights video there. Um, chapeau to the professional, caring and creative team at RGU Innovation. Congrats on another successful accelerator programme from Claudia at Converge. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we will be seeing a lot of these teams enter these national competitions and hopefully walk away um, after all of their amazing work they've done over this cohort. Uh, Craig Leith, lecturer in creative and cultural business. Loving this, well done to all the teams, mentors and judges and, well me. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the pitch from her colleague Rachel Ironside, so you'll have just seen that a few minutes ago, so well done to uh, Historical for that. Uh, Danella Beaton, Head of uh, Business, uh, Associate Vice Principal, sorry, uh, for Business and Economic Development. Uh, great business advice from Joe McSween and Duncan Reock. amazing to the team. Uh, makes me proud to be part of the RGU family. That is what we want. We want you to feel like this. We're beaming into your homes and sharing our, our lovely stories of our startup successes. Um, and we have a lovely dog, Poppy the dog, getting comfortable watching Startup Sunday Live, um, which I think is uh, Hannah Miley watching there um, with Poppy the dog. So thank you. Um, give us a bark if you've enjoyed it. Woof woof. Um, 
Okay, I think that is all of our social media for the moment. So now it's time to get to our final pitch. Um, and Hannah and Poppy will be looking forward to this one. For any of you out there who are considering being a professional athlete, um, your next entrepreneur could be reshaping the career of that potential athlete. Let's have a, a look at Ewan from Ampla. It was the 2018 Commonwealth Games in Australia and I was sitting in Team Scotland House failing miserably to scoop the last of Nutella out the jar during breakfast when this article popped up into my news feeds. GB athletes head to the job centre. Why would they need to head to the job centre? They're athletes and to many heroes. It wasn't until I was interviewing a retiring athlete on the final day of the Games that I realised that athletes are like that jar of Nutella. Hands up! who struggles to get all the Nutella out of the jar. To most, an empty jar of Nutella has no potential, just like a retiring athlete. But add a glass of milk, the right strategy, in this case some heat, and you can create something more lucrative and valuable than the original jar. Imagine there was a strategy to help athletes unlock their potential. We are Ampla, the agency for the modern athlete, offering athletes an opportunity to unlock their potential Short term, we generate income, but long term, we create futures. So, for an athlete, we create their brand, give them creative content, offer them commercial business opportunities, access to investment opportunities, and the opportunity to host events interacting with their fan base. And for corporate partners, we supply their brand with creative content, offering access to world-class athletes and production teams co-host athletes' events to interact with their fan bases and the opportunity to invest in athlete businesses. If we look at the athlete market, according to Dr. Michael J. Joyner, the average athlete has a professional career of about five years, peaking at 25. Combine that with the 50,000 elite athletes in the UK and it highlights the potential market. Observing the trends in sport, it reinforces two points in an athlete's career that are currently underserved by existing management companies. The first is towards the end of the career when traditional market methods stop working. And the second is right at the start. 100% of athletes we spoke to confirmed that they were only approached by management companies after their first successful appearance on an international team, moving into the commercial sector. If we look at the Olympics, four billion people worldwide engaged with Rio 2016. And NBC reported $1.2 billion of extra national advertising space leading into that Olympics. To any company, this is a perfect opportunity to capitalise on a worldwide audience. If the right strategy is applied before the Olympics with the right athlete, then we have the best chance of maximising commercial opportunities. In a lucrative market worth $500 billion, of course we've got direct and indirect competitors. Sports management companies, broadcast, network channels, marketing, events and creative agencies. Each competitor offers a very specialised service, but only a few offer multiple products. Leading the way with a package are the creative artist agencies, an entertainment and sports agency representing the most successful superstars around the world. Starting as a traditional agent, they have developed a collaboration of teams to offer the best range and quality of services on the market. What makes us different from all the rest is a move away from the traditional model of simply taking commission on direct athlete endorsements. By focusing on short-term gains based purely on current athlete performance means so many opportunities are being lost. We make money in three main ways. Corporate advertised partnerships, one-off or recurring contracts with our athletes, producing commercials, social media campaigns, and other advertising like a traditional advertising agency. Engagement subscriptions. For companies and fans, they can subscribe and get exclusive engagement opportunities through masterclasses, events, team building days, and appearances. Athlete companies. Each of our athletes fundamentally becomes a business, with Ampla as a shareholder. We work with each athlete to explore potential business opportunities. Clothing, publishing, fitness, 
coffee and distilleries are just some examples we have seen from retired athletes over the past 12 months. They have been created after retirement and we believe too late and a missed opportunity. Access to these markets is made possible with the team at Ampla. I am Ewan Duff, a content creator and founder of Ampla. 2018 was not just the start of this idea, but my first year working with global sports events and brands. Starting with the Commonwealth Games, it quickly led to others including the European Championships, Songhain Cup and the World Para Swimming Championships, along with recurring work from UK government sports bodies and international sports brands. Working alongside athletes and brands has given me a unique insight into the world of sport and an opportunity to research and test the target markets. Hannah Miley is our athlete in residence, a three-time Olympian, European record holder, Commonwealth, World, European and British champion swimmer. Her role is to be a mentor to our athletes, giving back her experiences from a journey that's taken her right round the world. New to Ampla and Head of Strategy is a sports content producer with global sports marketing experience. Graduating in 2016 with a degree in sports management, they have worked on a number of global sports campaigns, delivering content that has seen a 120% increase in their client's engagement. To many, he might be too young for such a role, but for Ampla, being at the forefront of trends and movements is key to ensure our athletes the best opportunity. This is the founding team behind Ampla, but by the end of year one, we aim to have grown to a team of 10, supported beneath by strong key partnerships and industry leaders. This is fundamental to grow our business and provide these services to athletes at a world-class level. We have a provisional list of athletes ready to begin a testing phase over the next six months. At a time of uncertainty, this model provides a lifeline to athletes, passionate sports fans and businesses we want to offer athletes an opportunity and believe now is the time to do it. Thank you for listening and we hope you're all safe and doing well during this difficult time. And there we have it, 10 of our startup finalists have pitched and you've had the chance to decide which one is your favourite. And as you've all been waiting for, it is now time for the Audience Choice Award. You get to choose which team walks away with £5,000 of cash. Here's how you can cast your vote. So you've had the chance to think about your favourite and are ready to cast your vote. Well, all you have to do is go to startupsunday.co.uk. Once you're there, then scroll down and look for the vote for your favourite button. You'll then be asked to enter your personal details, such as your email address. Finally, select the team that you want to win, and that's it. You'll only be able to vote once, and the winner will be announced in about 15 minutes' time. OK, have you got it? This is it. The Audience Choice Award is now open! Go online and cast your vote now. Now while you're doing that, we have prepared a little video to tell you a little bit more about what the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group has been up to this year, because we don't just do the Startup Accelerator programme, we have a number of other projects. So enjoy as we share our highlights of the year so far. So we've been hearing from some of the teams in our Startup Accelerator programme this afternoon. But there are another group of uh, budding entrepreneurs drawn from the RGU community who also deserve mention. And these are the 30 or so people who brave the cold January and February evenings to attend the, the Tech Hub in, in the centre of Aberdeen here and take part in our Innovation Academy. Now, the Innovation Academy was run over a number of evening sessions to provide aspiring entrepreneurs, freelancers, and people just with a business idea, the opportunity to come together and learn some of the principles of Lean Startup, learn about Business Model Canvas, hear some really practical tips on setting up, starting, running a business. So Hello everybody. 
My name is James Buckley and I'm our Programme Coordinator for the LENA project. My name is Candace and I am one of two Programme Coordinators for the LENA programme. LENA stands for the Libraries Innovation Network Aberdeenshire. The programme educates and highlights services available for startups and business owners in rural and semi-rural Aberdeenshire. Some of those facilities are co-working spaces, free Wi-Fi, free internet access. The programme launched in October 2019 and has so far helped over 100 individuals who are interested in starting or growing a business. And we've done this through our learning and skills development programme, which we deliver in groups in the libraries. At the moment, we offer a one-day business toolkit workshop and a six-session online accelerator. They're all fully funded by the LEDA initiative. LENA is a collaboration between Aberdeenshire Council's Live Like Aberdeenshire Library Service and RGU's very own Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group. It's designed so the one day workshop gives you a kind of a taster session um, for what the accelerator will, will involve. COVID-19 came along in March and changed everything. But that didn't stop Lena. True to the name of our department, we innovated and adapted quickly to bring our programmes and services online. And we're about to launch the first fully online Lena Accelerator. If you think Lena could help you with your business or your business idea, then visit www.rgu.ac.uk forward slash Lena. Alongside the Startup Accelerator, we have collaborated with Look Again to build similar programs for businesses and freelancers in the creative industries. Last summer, we ran a Creative Accelerator and this year we have developed a Creative Entrepreneurship Short Course. In March, we were ready to welcome 20 participants to our first workshop, but then of course, lockdown happened. In a week, we were able to move online with virtual workshops and digital workbooks. It has been amazing to see our participants develop their ideas learn from our guest speakers and importantly support each other to build their creative networks. Our first cohort have just submitted their online portfolios and we are getting ready to welcome the second cohort of 28 in June. Look Again will be hosting a virtual showcase for both cohorts later in the year and we are looking forward to working with them to build on our partnership and develop and deliver more programmes in the future. Ah, so many entrepreneurs and so much support available. Hopefully you've enjoyed our quick highlights of the other programmes we've offered. Now remember, you only have a few minutes left to cast your vote in this year's Audience Choice Award. So get online. But before we do that, as you can imagine, preparing an online event like this doesn't happen quite flawlessly. Um, so there have been a few bloopers in the production of our various startup pitches and videos. So we thought while you're casting your vote, let's share a couple of funny insights in the road to Startup Sunday Live. Enjoy. N? Of course we've got. Uh. For families of, 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 of autism affected people. Got I, you and Duff. Whoop. Ah. Actors? <laughs> Gamification. Mm. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Instagram. You know you're being recorded. Ah. <laughs> Real good boys, like it. Jimmy, sweet. Leading the way with this package. Oh. Ah. This is this is this is this is wah, 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 wah. <laughs> By a strong key. <laughs> oh, that was so close! Create biodegradable tour. This is so slow. Okay. <sighs> ah. World ah, uh, fuck.
Audience Choice Award is now closed for voting. Please do not go online, your vote will not be counted. Over the next few minutes, we are going to be counting up the scores to decide who has won £5,000 thanks to the votes casted by you. But before we get there, we have a message from our principal to share his views on our programme so far, but also has a very exclusive announcement to share. Over to you, John. Well, the teams have now made their pitches, the audience has voted, and the judges have reached their decisions. So before the final results are announced, I'd like to take this opportunity to first of all congratulate all the teams who participated in this year's programme. You're all winners as a result of the experience and learning you will have gained. Last year's cohort went on to raise over half a million pounds in investment funding, created dozens of jobs, and won several national awards. So I very much look forward to monitoring the progress of this year's cohort. On behalf of the university and the teams, I'd like to thank all those who supported this year's programme. Students, staff, alumni, entrepreneurs, mentors, and of course, today's judging panel. I'd reserve a particular thanks to the university's Entrepreneurship and Innovation Group, led by Professor Gordon McConnell and ably supported by Chris Mool, Ed Pollock, Sally Charles and Graham Carter. This group was formed less than two years ago to lead a major university strategic theme on entrepreneurship and innovation. And we're particularly grateful to the funding support provided for this by the Wood Foundation. One of the drivers for this initiative was to ensure that the university and its graduates were able to respond to and thrive in the impending fourth industrial revolution. In the ensuing period, the external context has been overlaid by a major emphasis on climate change, which regionally has translated into a focus on energy transition. And then of course, sadly, in the last few months, we've all been subject to a global pandemic. All of these, however, compound the importance of creating a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship. The success of the group over the past two years has been demonstrable in terms of both institutional and regional initiatives. A particular example has been the highly effective manner in which the university rapidly uh, translated from an on-campus operation to remote working while still maintaining a significant majority of its business. During these difficult times, the student community has demonstrated numerous examples of innovation and courage in helping support others at this difficult time. I'm therefore delighted to be able to announce today the launch of a new COVID-19 Student Innovation Award Scheme. This will have two prizes, one for the most innovative idea and the other for the most inspiring student. We're grateful to RGU Foundation for providing funding for the prizes for this award. Well, I have delayed the announcement of the results long enough, and so I'd like to conclude by thanking you all for engaging in today's event. Thank you. Have you been inspired by a fellow student who has gone above and beyond to help others during this pandemic? Or perhaps you have an innovative idea for a project which could make a difference, but need some funds to get it started. If you have, then now is your chance to enter the RGU COVID-19 Student Innovation Challenge. This competition is open to all current students and five winners will be awarded a cash prize of £500 each to recognise their innovation and inspiration in this challenging time. You can either nominate yourself or somebody else. Winners will be awarded one of either the following prizes. Innovative Idea Prize for those who have a creative project which can help others around them or Inspirational Student Prize for those whose actions have made a real impact and demonstrated compassion and kindness. 
Entries to the challenge are open now and will close on Tuesday the 30th of June 2020. Spread the word and enter now at www.rgu.ac.uk forward slash student innovation challenge. And there we have it. Voting is closed. You have made your decision. In a few minutes, we will find out which teams will be walking away thousands of pounds richer. So, in a second, we are going to be cutting to our judges to find out a little bit about who has won. But before then, you may have noticed the audience competition has also closed. So which, let's find out which one of you at home is going to be walking away with 100 pounds worth of Amazon vouchers. Thank you, we have had hundreds of people. This ha entry has been chosen at random. Hopefully you spotted that the correct word was innovation. And of all the correct entries, the one that has been shuffled, the winner of the audience competition is Nick Ironsides. I'm assuming that is Rachel's partner, so congratulations to you. Um, we will have your email address and we will get in touch and share with you 100 pounds worth of Amazon vouchers. But now, it's time to go to our judges to find out who has won these awards. We're gonna start by looking at the most improved business award. And we have Jared Owen, Director of Entrepreneurship, Digital and Entrepreneurship at Opportunity North East. I'm now going to cut to you, Jared, to announce the winner. Hey, thank you, Ed. Uh, I have to say it's a real pleasure to be here with you virtually today and the energy from everyone involved is absolutely fantastic to see. Um, I'm not sure if I can unsee, however, the view of Chris in his underpants, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, without further ado, this award is for the most improved category. It is presented to the startup team who's demonstrated through their pitch the most progress and development with their idea over the course of the startup accelerator process. Areas that impressed the judges in this category from the winner were a good demonstration of functionality on the MVP, good use of statistics and research towards the business plan, and lastly, recognition of the accelerator program and support they received. And the winner is Knitted. Well done, Lucy and the Knitted team. Great work. Congratulations to Knitted. You are the most improved business award. Congratulations. And um, for all of your hard work, £5,000 is coming to you for that. Now, next up, we are going to be announcing uh, the Best Picture Award. And to deliver that, we have Fiona Godman, CEO of the Scottish Institute for Enterprise. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you very much, Ed. And I'm absolutely blown away by this event. So well done to the whole team for putting it on and for your very, very professional emceeing. It's terrific. So I have the challenge, I have the delight to be able to announce the winner of the best pitch. And it wasn't an easy decision for the judges to make because really the quality of the pitches, the video pitches we had to judge was excellent. But the winner gave a very clear, beautifully presented pitch. And ultimately it's not just about the quality of the video presentation. As a judge, I understood their product. I understood how it would be used, who their customers were, and that as a team, they had the capability to deliver. So together, the judges agreed that the winner of the best pitch is historical. Well done. Woohoo, fantastic. Well done to Rachel Stewart and Glenn from Storico. Again, another £5,000 for the Best Pitch Award. Congratulations to you now. Only two awards left and 10 startups could be potentially winning them. The next judge we're going to go to is Mike Wilson, founder and chairman of Across IP, who will be introducing the most innovative idea of the world. Over to you, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. And this is all about innovation. Uh, we had some tremendous pitches by all the participants who reached these final stages and we saw innovation in all the presentations in fact. And the winner was chosen because they validated their innovation with customer pilot and they had demonstrated some partnering with industry and they had clear international ambitions. So I'd just like to announce that the winner is a tender. Well done. 
Congratulations to attender Chama, Nimali and Kyle. You have won the most innovative idea prize. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. Thank you to all of our judges um, for voting and making such a difficult decision. I think we'll all agree and um, this was a very hard choice to make. So thank you all for all of your hard work. So we have three winners. Knit it for the most improved business idea. We have uh, Historical for the best pitch award and we have a tender for the most innovative idea. So now let's get ready uh, to announce the audience choice award, the one you have been waiting for. So could the team that you've chosen walk away with double their money? It could be one of the three we've just announced. It could be there's another £5,000 up for grabs. And now since we have missed out on Eurovision this year. Um, we have our Eurovision style entry for this one. So let's find out who is winning the Audience Choice Award. There is one missing up at the top, but don't worry, it could be them as well. So we're gonna count down based on the vote. Uh, in run, round one, we'll find out which seven businesses uh, did not get through to that final round and achieve enough votes. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, your business stays in there. Um, so, in no particular order, the teams out of the final 10 who did not achieve enough votes to get through were, oh, 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 okay, so if you can't spot that on the screen, left, we have Kairos, Knit It and Relaxation Revolution. Unfortunately to all those who now have disappeared from the screen, uh, thank you so much for your entries, but you're not in this final three. Okay, so there are three teams up for grabs for this final £5,000. In third place in the Audience Choice Award 2020, we have Relaxation Revolution. Okay, so our final two. It is between Knit It, who have already won £5,000 and could double their money to walk away with 10, or Kairos. Who did you vote for to win? £5,000 worth of additional funding. Are we ready? Oh, get your Twitter on, get hashtag Startup Sunday Live trending. Who is it going to be in second place for the Audience Choice Award 2020? We have Knit It, which means that our winners this year are Kairos with the Audience Choice Award. £5,000 go to you, Kairos. Congratulations for all of your hard work. I'm prepared, I have a party popper. Way! Hopefully that didn't deafen your eardrums too much. Congratulations to all of the teams for entering this year as part of Startup Sunday Live. We thank all of you for watching, all of your hard work and incredible effort. It's been fantastic. And now to close out the show for me, I've been Edward Fox, your host. Enjoy speaking to the startup teams. We are gonna close the day with our head of entrepreneurship and innovation, Chris Moore. Well, that's it, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you were entertained and inspired. All it leaves for me to do is to thank my colleagues and friends who made this all possible. So first of all, the EIG team, we have Professor Gordon McConnell, who lit that fire and has been the inspiration to us since joining us in 2017. There's Naz, there's Margaret, there's James, there's Candace. There's Chelsea, there's uh, Laura, of course, and Laura has been fantastic with her editing skills. Also, a big shout out to Thor Holt for helping with the pitching as well. Other colleagues in RGU, there's the marketing team and the comms team, especially Anna and Jack and Velath who have helped us with the communications. Then we need to thank our speakers uh, for, for joining us today, so Sir Ian Wood, and uh, Ivan McKee, the minister, and of course, Principal John Harper. Thank you for your contributions today. Then there's a whole number of other people. There are the judges that judged them uh, for this Startup Sunday. Then there's, of course, all the judges that helped us throughout the process of the Accelerator program. There's the incredible mentors that have joined us throughout the program as well. The guest speakers that have come and spoken to our communities of entrepreneurs. And then, of course, we should never forget the Wood Foundation for the funding that they've provided. And of course, there's our startups. Congratulations to all our winners. Woo! You've done an amazing job, all of you. You're all winners. Uh, all the finalists did a fantastic job. You've done really well. And of course, I have to thank my colleagues in the EIT team, Sally, Graham, Ed, for their continued commitment. 
and their passion and their expertise and their humour. And a big shout out to Edward for this amazing event that he's put on today, the Startup Sunday Live event. The work he's put into it, I think you'll agree, it's been an incredible event. Finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us. And I hope that you stay safe and stay well. And we're able to meet with you all in person really soon. Take care and thanks for joining us.